Welcome everybody real quick to the uh, all right. one and three show. Welcome everybody real quick. This to is the, uh, uh, actually, hold on. Right. One and three show. Welcome myself. everybody real quick. Alright, can everybody hear me? Is the audio good? It's been like two years since I've live streamed. You good chat? Can you hear me? Alright, cool. I want to welcome everybody to the one and three show. Uh, if you're watching this through a recording, this is an in-depth at me making a million dollars in the next three years. If you haven't seen it yet, I have a series called uh, Let's Make a Mill, Episode 1. So if you're watching this on a recording, go watch that video as well as what I learned reading 50 books on money and long-term investing. Because this show is basically an in-depth look and a live commentary on those things. And I'm going to be interacting with you, uh, the chat, as well as my team that I'm building but real quick, I'm going to put this on pause, and we're going to wait for about another three or four minutes to let some people get in here, and then we'll get going. If you guys have any questions, shoot them in the uh, chat, and then I'll uh, see if I can answer them as we're going through this. chat if you guys have anybody uh, that's interested in money or investing or anything like this go ahead and you know sh uh, share this video on your Instagram your Facebook wherever um, let's try to help each other out In, depending on where you're at, uh, definitely down for meetups. That's a good question, Mitch. I'll, uh, I'll answer that one uh, in this live stream.
Uh, it's climbing to 131. Not familiar with Joe Rogan's one mil deal with Spotify. That's a good one, man. That's a very good one. What'd you say, Mansoor? That's a very interesting topic to delve into, man. Are you familiar with it, Mansoor? Do you know anything about the deal? Oh yeah. Patrick made a whole a whole analysis on on value attainment for ten minutes about what happened. Okay, I'll have to. Uh, you want to give me a quick rundown before we start the stream? Yeah, uh, Spotify gave him a hundred million dollars to move his platform from YouTube to Spotify. <laughs> so Joe Rogan is a hundred million dollars richer than what he was before, and he added four billion dollars in their market capitalization. In, in a few hours, in a few hours, Spotify spent a hundred million and gained, gained four billion dollars worth of worth of market value, and that just shifted the whole valuation up for for all content creators. And this just goes to show you how Spotify, although they're they're not they're a small smaller player than Google, obviously than YouTube, they went for their number one guy, not their number ten guy, not their number twenty five guy. They went to their number one guy, Joe Rogan, by testament for capitalism, took him there. And everybody right now, I mean, it's such a strategic move, such a good play by Spotify, because they just, everybody right now, I'm telling you, is going to be moving, moving Spotify. I've never used them before, but everybody right now is going to be me making a move. And obviously, because they're going there for Joe Rogan, they're going to be exploring a lot of different stuff. So, Spotify, well played. All right, cool. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit at the end then. Um, for, yeah, so who's talking right now? This is, uh, I'll introduce you guys to some of my team. When we get started, I'm going to, we'll go ahead and fire up in about one minute. Uh, I'm gonna go use the restroom real quick.
All right, for everybody that's tuning in, I just want to welcome you guys to the one and three show. This is the basically in-depth version of Let's Make a Mill series that I'm making. If you haven't seen that, go check it out. Um, for everybody that's tuning in, just wanted to let you know on what this is. This is essentially a live version of me interacting with the community and answering you guys' questions, as well as I want to introduce my team real quick. For those of you who have seen the uh, Let's Make a Mill series, you probably heard that I was building a team. This is some of my team that's in here right now. We've got uh, Mansoor. This is my, one of my mentors and partners in this endeavor. That's who you just heard talking earlier about Spotify deal. Uh, Jose, Eddie. Uh, Eddie is pretty, pretty knowledgeable on uh, uh, building and improving your credit, which he'll uh, have a little talk in here in a little bit. We got Adrian and Declan. Now, we're actually missing about eight or so of my team. Um, we had a death in the, uh, one of the families, so about three or four people are out, unfortunately. Courtney, if you're watching this, my condolences. I hope you're doing well. But uh, let's go ahead and get started. So since this is episode one, I want to uh, focus more on the personal growth tips, uh, tips and tricks of the past four years of me basically quitting my career, building passive streams of income, and you know, constantly improving myself and also my quality of living and how you guys can do the same. <clears throat> We're going to be talking about universal ways to improve your cash flow uh, so you can invest more and build more passive streams of income. And at the very end, we're going to talk about basic money management to capitalize on market crashes like the uh, events that are happening right now. And we'll be getting into a little bit about uh, how hedges can be used um, to increase your profit when it comes to long-term investing. We won't be focusing too much on trading, but the technical analysis of trading, I will be applying to some of the stuff we're talking about. But let me uh, introduce you guys to a concept that I was actually taught by one of my mentors, Matt Sapala. You've probably seen him if you follow my Instagram. Uh, I've been posting him a lot. I'll pull him up real quick just to give him credit for this because I, uh, I can't take credit for this specific uh, concept. There's his Instagram. So if you guys want to follow him. So this is uh, this is one of my mentors as well, Matt Sapala. Uh, he is a self-made millionaire and originally was a what was he, Mansoor? He was a door gunner, right, for the Marines. Correct. He was a door gunner in the Marines for eleven years. He has a PhD. Uh, public high school diploma and his PhD led him to his MBA, which is his massive bank account. All right, cool. Yeah, so if you guys want to follow him, you can. But uh, so the four levels of wealth. Um, the first one is survival, status, and then freedom and purpose. Now, each person, everybody watching this, you'll be in different levels. So one of the hard parts about making content on YouTube is that I have to curate it to a broad audience and everybody's going to be in a different situation. Uh, the majority of people throughout their entire life, especially our parents, typically live in the survival and status phase of the four levels of wealth. Um, so survival is pretty self-explanatory. It's living paycheck to paycheck. I did this for about 10 years of my life from 15 to 25 years old. I finally got tired of it and wanted to, you know, freedom. I actually started watching YouTube videos on a guy that was traveling through Thailand and Asia uh, nonstop. And it was just amazing to me to see somebody living a life like that. And I was thinking, like, how can I do this? So I started to build a game plan uh, at 24 to 25 years old on how to quit my career, which I ended up doing two years later and uh, at 27 years old. The second level is status. Um, this is people that they, they have a secure source of revenue and income. You know, this is somebody that's graduated college. They have a... They're making anywhere from eighty to two hundred thousand dollars a year, maybe less, but they, they have some stable source of income. They've got a job or career that they're doing long term. But uh, as if you're in that situation, you probably find that you eventually don't want to be doing that for the rest of your life, or you want to get into more freedom. So when it comes to freedom, I would I'm currently in cash flow freedom. You know, I can I, I make enough money per month to 
basically do whatever I want and travel and live anywhere. All my work's remote from a laptop or a computer. So I could be doing this in Italy or Buenos Aires or Thailand, but uh, currently I'm in Austin. <laughs> but uh, each, and then the last level is purpose. This is where you get so much money, you basically wake up one day and you're like, well, what do I do now that uh, you know, I've got all this money and this freedom, I've achieved everything that I wanna do financially and career-wise, so what else is there? So each level has its own problems and its own solutions. So quick, quick answer in the chat, you know, what level are you guys in? What, what is most of my viewership in? Are you guys status or survival or freedom? Status. Who, uh, which, which one of my team said status? Me. Jose, okay. Mansour, yeah. are you in freedom yet? No, not at all. Um, I, I don't consider myself in freedom whatsoever. Uh, I think barely scratching status even, ba based on what I consider status. Yeah. Yeah, status, so status is an interesting one. Status is, it's not just having a secure uh, field or a secure income stream, it's you have enough money to do some of the things that you want, but you constantly have to trade your time to get the, what you want. So as soon as you stop working, you basically have to uh, make more money to do what you want or your life kind of falls apart. Um, there's a lot of, uh, well, this epidemic is actually a very interesting uh, social experiment that's happened in the recent months. So most people are survival and status and it looks like the majority of us in the chat are in survival as well and status. Do we have any freedom guys in here? All right, we got, uh, how do you say your name, Dominaz? I, I can't pronounce it. Uh, you're in freedom, but most people are in survival. Yeah, so let's start with survival. The first and number one thing in survival is building your cash flow. You, you've got to increase the amount of money you're making every month. And there's a ton of ways to do that. We'll talk more about it in the, uh, later on in this video. Um, but number one thing is to increase your cash flow. The more money you can make per month, the more money you can then invest and leverage into assets, which will build you passive income streams. Um, and then which will, will eventually result you into the freedom, uh, the freedom uh, third level. The next thing you do is reduce expenses and you also want to start learning how assets work. So when you're in survival mode, your, your first and foremost function and the thing you should uh, focus on the most over everything else is increasing your cash flow. You want to study the next levels above that. So Um, Vital. I, I made a book or I made a video on 50 books on money. Go watch that. I talk about the, the books there. There's a list in the description of videos that talk about uh, the best books for studying finance and wealth. The next level status, you know, at this point, you've already got a secure stream or multiple streams of income, but they're all uh, things you're doing to trade your hours for or trade your time for money. What you want to work on at this point is start doing self-improvement, you want to start building yourself into a person that has a lot of value that you can give to people, um, such as mentors and colleagues or people that you can hire into uh, whatever it, it is you're doing. We'll, we'll, get, we'll touch more on this in the next slide. And then you also want to start connecting with like-minded people, assuming that you have an interest and stuff that you want to get into. Um, one of the most important things to becoming successful isn't just the knowledge that you have, it's also the people that you know. I mean, uh, Mansoor, would you agree with that? You know, if you were to, you know, based on everything you were doing alone, now that you're in this team and this network, what, what would your opinion be on networking versus uh, improving yourself? Well, you know what, Garrett, I one of um, what one of the people who I uh, listened to in the past, I. Um, I'm not sure if your followers know who Grant Cardone is. Obviously, he's a well-known figure in real estate. But I, I heard him once ask, pose a question that's very, very intriguing and very thought-provoking is, would you like to have $1 billion or would you like to have 1 billion friends? 
And uh, you think about it, obviously a billion dollars sounds very attractive. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, especially for a guy like me, <laughs> right? But if you think about it, you know, it's time, money is not what you want, it's really relationships. You have 1 billion friends and I'm not talking about uh, just colleagues, I'm talking about real friends. The relationship capital is what brings the money. The relationship capital is what opens up opportunities. The relationship capital is what gives. Is what gives me. So when people say your net worth is, is your net worth, uh, I, I, I actually, I'm, I'm a living testament to that because I'm, I'm not from the United States, I'm from Saudi Arabia. And I, I put myself in an environment to, to increase my knowledge, to increase my skill set. And that was the whole reasoning behind that is to put myself in environments where I'm able to access people who are a lot ahead of me in life. And that to me is very powerful because instead of waiting for you to figure things out, you're, you're, you're able to borrow other people's experience. So the guy like you, Garen, I think is a, is, a, is a good example because had I not met you, I, I would not learn the power of, of social media and YouTube and starting a YouTube channel, building an audience like that. So definitely that's the value of having a network. Yeah, I completely agree. I, uh, in the next slide, I'll, I'll, we're about to dive into uh, me showing you who I used to be back 10 years ago. I, I've got a bunch of uh, old Facebook pictures and videos, and I, I just want to show the uh, audience who I used to be versus who I am today. And I'm also going to show you the net worth and the money. I, I have a graph that's going to show you um, how much my income increased when I started educating myself and working on myself, and then what happened when I started networking and connecting with people uh, that were in similar interests and were, you know, basically mentoring or helping me in my endeavors. But I just realized that I didn't have uh, this slide up. I, I had the wrong screen up. So this is actually the uh, slide I was wanting to show you guys, the four levels of wealth. You know, again, we have career, which is survival and status, and then we have freedom and purpose, which is passive sources of income. So once you get into freedom, um, you're going to have some new problems that arise in there. The first one is going to be time optimization, helping others, and your wealth protection. So if you are if you read The Intelligent Investor, Warren Buffett, um, Benjamin Graham, you know that the number one rule to investing in passive sources of income is first, don't lose any of the money you have. And the second rule is don't forget rule number one. And then the third rule is make more money. You know, um, when it comes to at the point when you have a million dollars or hundred thousand uh, dollars built up, you essentially look at that as time invested. So, for me, I've got about fifty thousand dollars in net worth right now. It took me four years to build that up, and you know, if I was to lose all of that money tomorrow, that's four years of my life gone. So, you, you don't ever want to look at money as a dollar amount. You always want to look at it as a time amount because. Um, now, for those of you who are traders in this and you've been you, you know, studying trading, you understand that for every 10% you lose, you have to gain back 20%. The same thing applies when it comes to time and your money. You, you definitely have to value your time. So time optimization, getting in more efficient with your time, organizing yourself, organizing your schedules, organizing who you're working with, and just increasing your efficiency of how you spend your time and what you spend it on is super important when you get into the freedom uh, level and I'm kind of in a segue. I'm in between status and freedom, but I'm also working on purpose as well. So even if you're in one category, you might have things that you're also working on in all four categories. It's not like an exact linear scale. Um, so earlier I said I was cash flow free. I, I make enough money per month to do whatever I want, but I'm not financially free. I'm not asset free or passive free. I still have to put in time and to put in work to acquire the freedom that I've got. Um, and then the last one is purpose. You know, we won't touch on this one too much because it's going to be a long, it, that's, there's only one person in here that said they were in the freedom level. But, uh, you know, one day you're going to wake up and you're going to have enough money to do whatever you want. And then you're going to either realize that you want to spend time with your friends and family or uh, you don't have any friends and family, at which point you need to work on those as well. Um, but once you get to that level, you know, it, when you study multimillionaires and billionaires, especially the older ones, they almost always end up giving away all of their wealth and they give away all of their knowledge and what they've learned because they understand that they can't take the money that they made with them to the grave. The only thing that they can leave behind is, you know, the impact that they made in the world or the value and knowledge that they get passed down to the next generations. 
and you know my YouTube channel is kind of a roundabout you know way to tackle freedom and purpose at the same time but let's move on to the next one so this is uh, the most valuable assets you own um, the first one is always you and everything else is built upon that down uh, if you know we've got viewers that are all the way from 18 to 30 40 years old um, the number one rule that I've always had is uh, you always improve yourself every single day, no matter what you're doing. This is this concept alone is kind of my 1% rule. I basically, back five years ago when I was 25 years old, I decided to change around my entire life. And I said, I told myself, you know, I don't have to conquer the world in a single day, but if I just improve myself 1%, every day within a few years, I'm gonna be an entirely different person than I was. So I would say first and foremost, no matter what level you're in, whether your freedom status, uh, survival, whatever, it always comes down to self-improvement and trying to educate yourself and better yourself. So, you know, if you stop improving yourself, you basically stagnate and you know, eventually die and you can even recede backwards into your success and you know who you are. Um, but in order to kind of put this in the picture, guys, I have to now do show you some pretty embarrassing photos and videos of who I used to be 10 years ago. I'm 30 now. The person that you see on YouTube and on my Instagram and all the stuff that I'm doing was definitely not who I was uh, 10 years ago. So let me uh, pull up some Facebook photos. But before I do, I kind of want to put an image of what you're about to see. Uh, I, I call this my alter ego. Um, this uh, a girl that I used to date said that I had two personalities. I had Garen, the guy that was driven and has goals and ambitions and you know, gets shit done. And then I have Gareth, the uh, destructive version of myself, the guy that uh, loves to destroy things and cause mayhem and has no goals or ambitions and just kind of you know lives a uh, more chaotic life. I... <clears throat> so let me... Uh... Find these. So this is pretty much the first photo I ever put up online, and you know, just this photo alone kind of shows who I used to be. This is 18 years old. I'm still in high school. I went over to my friend's house, and they had the like a notebook of tattoo, the water tattoos. And they asked me if I wanted one, and I was like, "Give them all to me." So they slapped a bunch of tattoos on me, and I wore these around for a couple days, uh, and that kind of personifies. Who I was back then. I, I didn't. I almost failed high school. I remember when I took the SATs. I basically just took a pencil and drew a line straight down them, turned it in in like three minutes, and then got a six-hour nap. So this guy, Gareth, was not a man of dedication, goals, or action, or anything like that. He just did whatever he wanted, anytime he wanted. This is me at spring break of Panama City, uh, 2010. I was 20 years old here. This is me making a hot tub in during spring break, and I ended up getting kicked out of my hotel because uh, they yelled at us because I had kind of rallied the two hotel rooms next to me to build an assembly line of dumping buckets of water into the truck bed. And the uh, manager said that we couldn't do that, we had to stop. So I threw my truck in reverse and slammed on the brakes, and a tidal wave of water flew out into the uh, office of the hotel. So they kicked us out, and then I uh, ended up uh, just staying with some friends down in another hotel. <sighs> I can't, I can't believe I'm showing these this stuff in uh, on my YouTube. But this is my friends, 2009, 19 years old. We bought some samurai swords and uh, airsoft guns in Gatlinburg. Ended up kind of destroying that uh, hotel. <sighs> this is uh, a Pretty good video of my attitude towards life. <laughs> and this is where I used to work. So this is the career that I did. This was a uh, aluminum foundry and CNC shop. I worked here for 12 years of my life, basically making mold, pouring it metal, cutting metal, uh, programming the CNC machines. This guy is old maker. He's making green sand mold, which is what you see right here. This guy is pulling molten metal, pulling it into the mold. Uh, let, me, uh, let me turn down the desktop audio. Is that better? Is the audio good, guys? <laughs> yeah, 
you know, the dumping the molds, uh, pulling out the castings, and we we cut and grind those. But you know, this is where I worked for 12 years of my life. This is uh, this was survival status the entire way through. I basically just worked to party and then party to work. This is me screwing with one of my best friends, or not, because the video is not going to load. So I, I took some oil and I poured it down into the mold. And uh, when you pour molten metal on oil, it turns into a flame. So this was his first day of pouring molten metal. Light the fuck it up. Yep, so I'll just run through these. This is a 40 foot beer pong or beer bong that I made. You know, Dad, if you're watching this, I don't think I ever told you this story. Uh, but yeah, I did sneak into the shop and uh, build a 40 foot beer pong one day. This is uh, one of many party houses that I lived in during my early 20s. As you can see, I was an extremely organized and clean person, very uh, dedicated in what I was doing. I think Joey actually is in the live stream right now. He's probably watching. This is a photo of uh, the other guys. I don't know if you guys seen that movie, um, the cop movie with uh, Will Ferrell and um, Mark Wahlberg. We I, that movie came out, and I went and laminated this photo immediately and put it on the front wall of our party house. So it was the first centerpiece thing that you saw when you walked in the house, kind of set the tone of uh, what we're about. This is a stripper pole that we installed in one of the houses. This was an average Friday to Saturday night, many weekends uh, like this. Some girls doing body shots, more girls, another girl I was dating, more girls, another girl. This is uh, Joey as well, one of my old roommates. I don't even remember this photo. He, he actually sent me this today. Uh, I didn't even remember this scene or where this bar is at or who this girl is. This is a 40-foot teeter-totter that me and Joey and another guy stole from a frat house, and we moved it into another frat house yard and then lit it on fire and started a frat war between the, uh, the two frats for the year. <sighs> this is me spring or uh, Halloween. It was like 10 degrees out, snowing and flip-flops. I uh, was running through the snow and almost got frostbite that day. This is a van that I took from the shop and we took the electrical tape and put it on the side of the van uh, with free candy during Halloween and we were driving around throwing uh, candy at uh, college kids going through. <sighs> this is uh, me and Joey again, saran wrapping uh, a girl's car. This is me screwing with more coworkers, throwing firecrackers at them. Another coworker, well. <sighs> this is my friends crashing. Oh my god, oh my god, they're really gonna fucking do it, dude. <laughs> a car into a tree. <laughs> And this is me uh, blowing up a uh, fire with uh, air, air, aerosol cans. Uh, well, it's not going to load. And then this is a photo of me about two or three years ago. Uh, yeah, two years ago when I started to kind of work on myself and get my shit together. So the point is, and the reason I'm showing you all this stuff, guys, is you know, don't compare yourself to other people. Don't compare yourself to anybody that you're looking at, especially not me. You know, there's a lot of people here watching that are 18, 20, 22 years old. If you're that young and you're already working towards these things in life, you were light years ahead of me uh, at that age. I, uh, I mean, that personifies who I was for about from 15 to 25, eh, 24 years old, 23 years old. I had no direction in life, no goals, nowhere I was going. Um, so, you know. Let me read chat real quick. You need you needed Jordan Peterson. Yes, yes, I absolutely did. We're actually gonna uh, we're about to talk about Jordan Peterson quite a bit. So, yeah, the point is, don't compare yourself to other people. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday. Compare yourself to who you were a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, five, ten years ago, and then have a game plan for who you're going to become in the future. 
Um, don't spend, don't waste any time looking at other people because you have no idea who that person is, what their real life is, especially on social media, especially on YouTube. Um, this is the first time I've kind of shared this on YouTube. So yeah, just work on yourself every single day. You are always the most valuable asset that you own. You know, you're, you're the person that you can control the most in your life. And then from there, then you get into your network, you know, your mentors, your children, your friends, your colleagues, your acquaintances. These are the people that are going to help you grow and improve and, you know, help you stick to your goals and will inspire you and make you into the person that you're wanting to become. And then the last thing is obviously the things you own, your real estate, stocks, business, and cash and debt. <sighs> what made me change my mind from the YOLO? <laughs> Basically, I just got tired of it. I, you know, you can only do that stuff for so long before you wake up one day and you're like, how am I doing with my life? Like I've been, I'm doing the same thing over and over and over and getting nowhere. But you know, I think a big part of it was I didn't have any goals. I, I actually had the motto in life that if you don't set any goals, you can't fail. Uh, so, you know, not having goals is a good thing if you don't uh, ever have to fail at it. Uh, I am into stoicism quite a bit, but, uh, the uh, next one we're going to talk about is the big five personality traits. Whoever said Jordan Peterson, you're spot on. Um, what I'm going to show you guys real quick, if you're not familiar with this, this is the big five personality traits. And what psychologists have found do, through these studies is that these five traits, and if, if you work on these traits and you improve these traits, uh, three of them have the biggest indication for success in life. You know, in our society, we focus on SAT scores and IQ and what college you went to, where you're born, middle class, lower class, upper class. Um, and some of those things are important a little bit, but that's only when you look at U.S. as a whole. When you look at immigrants and you look at people that came from other countries and moved here, uh, a lot of those ideas and stuff break down because there's tons of immigrants that came here with nothing and built fantastic lives for themselves. But let me show you guys this video real quick on uh, what, well, is it gonna, and it's not working, hold on. Big five personality traits, there's, okay, hold on, I've busted my setup real quick. Now we'll just do this way. So if you, if you don't know who Jordan Peterson is, let me introduce him real quick. This is Jordan Peterson. He's a psychologist at the University of Toronto, extremely intelligent individual, has dedicated his entire life to basically understanding people and helping them better their lives. Uh, he's got a book called 12 Rules of Life, a fantastic book, 12,000 reviews on it, uh, Amazon. I highly recommend it. It's helped a lot of people get their life together and fix themselves. This, this is the book that I wish I would have had at 18 years old. It probably would have saved me a lot of time and headache. And then he's got a website called Understand Myself, which is basically a 100, 100 question uh, exam that gives you a quick and dirty version of your, your five big traits and what, what you rank on those. And we'll come back to this in a minute. I don't want you guys to like take this right now, but let me show you this video, maybe. Okay, hold on. Hi, everyone. So I'm making an announcement today. I'm going to uh, speed and this up to. I suppose you a might regard it as an advertisement. We're only going to watch so about warning you two minutes of it. To begin with, because I don't want you to waste your time. You may want to increase the volume. Interested here. in listening to a description of the newest thing that we've created. So That's we just put up a yet. website called understandmyself.com, and it's a personality assessment for individuals. And it's based on a personality model that was developed in my lab about 10 years ago by Dr. Colin D. Young. And uh, Lee, Dr. Lena Quilty, Dr. DeYoung is now a professor at the University of Minnesota. And it was based on some ideas that I had been developing with another former student of mine, Dr. Daniel Higgins, who's a partner with me in this enterprise, along with my former graduate supervisor, Dr. Robert Peel from McGill University. It's based on the big five personality model, which measures extroversion, uh, which is a positive emotion dimension and is associated with gregariousness and enthusiasm and assertiveness and sociability and that sort of thing. And 
uh, a trait called neuroticism, which is basically negative emotionality, which is associated with a proclivity towards anxiety and emotional pain. Agreeableness, which is compassion and politeness. And so agreeable people are, I would say, broadly speaking, rather maternal in their orientation. They tend to care more for others than for themselves. They're more cooperative than competitive, whereas so-called disagreeable people are more competitive and more brusque, I would say, and perhaps more straightforward and more able to stand up for themselves as well. Conscientiousness is another one of the dimensions. That's orderliness and industriousness. And uh, the last dimension is openness to experience, which is a combination of interest in ideas, which is often known as intellect, and uh, interest in aesthetics, um, and which is associated, let's say, with creativity. And that's the dimension that's also most highly correlated with IQ. We developed the Big Five Aspect Scale in an attempt to take the Big Five, so that's extroversion, neuroticism, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and openness to experience, which are the canonical dimensions of personality. We developed the Big Five Aspect Scale in order to break down those Big Five traits, each of them into their two most statistically robust subcomponents, huh? and we call those aspects, and that's actually become okay. a big So, uh, pull this back up. So the big five personality traits. Um, what psychologists have found over the past 30 years or so of studying all this stuff is that there's two major factors to becoming successful in life over everything else, over your SAT scores or where you're born or what college you went to, none of that stuff really matters when it comes to success in life. The, the two biggest factors for success is first, your openness to experience. This is your ability to learn new things, your curiosity, your abstract thinking, uh, and your conscientiousness, which is the other trait. Uh, this is goal setting, cleanliness, organization, and then the, the net, these are all spectrums. So you, you have a zero to 100 scale and you fall somewhere in this scale. People that are low in openness, uh, I'll show you an example in a minute, but <laughs> the analogy I use is imagine locking yourself in a room for the, your entire life and never going out and meeting anybody or doing anything or experiencing anything. You're probably not gonna live a really successful life. You're not gonna, and you're definitely not gonna live an enjoyable life. Um, so the more open you can become in life, the more you can push yourself into unknown territories, unknown boundaries, you know, doing things that are difficult, doing things that scare you, the more successful you're going to become uh, in life, no matter what it is you're doing. And this is across all boards, across all careers, no matter what you're doing. And then conscientiousness is obviously kind of self-explanatory. If you're not capable of setting goals, if you're not capable of being clean and organized, if you don't plan anything, if you live aloof your entire life, you know, me 10 years ago, Gareth, you know, he was extremely unconscientious. Um, and I'll, I'll pull up my stats real quick. I actually took the big five person for Jordan Peterson's understand myself. But the third and kind of also super important one is extroversion. Now, this depends on what you're trying to do. But for my team and everybody that's watching that's going to be in my team, you know, as salesmen, your extroversion is extremely important. You have to be able to talk to people and interact with people uh, effectively in order to be a good salesman and in order to help people. You're, the way you present yourself is extremely important if you're trying to go that route. And then lastly, you have neuroticism, which is basically being level. There, there's actually two subcategories of neuroticism. Um, there's volatility and I think just neuroticism, but volatility is like your explosiveness uh, and uh, people that are highly neurotic will suffer from not taking action, not getting out into the world. They uh, can be, suffer from analysis paralysis. And uh, the last one is agreeableness. This can also be switched with competitiveness. So it's not necessarily like you're a dick or anything. It's more, uh, do you believe in what you say? And are you competitive when you debate people, when you stand for what you believe in? Uh, or are you more middle ground where you're kind of a mediator and you talk to people and you'll, you'll understand different concepts and thoughts? Or are you at the extreme end or you're a pushover? Are you somebody that lets people walk over you? <clears throat> so to give you a quick, quick and dirty example, um, this is Chris Hemingsworth, his character in, in the Marvel movies. The reason I am using the stuff is because it's something that a lot of people can relate to. Uh, Chris Hemingsworth, if you've seen the entire movie series, Thor and the Avengers, you know that he went from somebody that was very uh, conscientious, very tenacious, very uh, hard work ethic, you know, believed in what he was doing. And then he got defeated by Thanos and became Fat Thor and uh, basically the big Lebowski and had uh, no driver ambition, didn't go anywhere. So, you know, that's two polar examples of conscientiousness, 
and uh, openness to experience. Um, so one of the questions that I got on Instagram was uh, how, how I read 50 books in uh, five months. And actually, I don't know if I, I don't think I said uh, that I read these 50 books in a five month time period. But the way I did that is essentially because I was in an extremely painful situation in my life. You know, like I've just explained, I was somebody with no direction in life. I wasn't going anywhere. I wasn't really doing anything with my life. And that caused me to kind of really reevaluate my situation. The graph I wanted to show you guys, uh, this, this is a graph, a visual representation of my net worth and my debt over the course of a three year period or a four year period um, when I was trying to get my life together. So you can see from January 16th to the 17th, uh, the beginning of that was just a flat line bar. This was basically living paycheck to paycheck. I knew nothing about money. I didn't watch any of these videos. I wasn't a YouTuber yet. I was working at the Foundry partying all the time. And my net worth and the money that I had represented that. So I decided to quit my career January 2017, right here, this line. I sold a car to start my YouTube channel. I quit my career and then... Uh, went from $13,000 in the bank account to $0 in the bank account in an eight month period. And I racked up about $11,000 in credit card debt. This was <clears throat> financially my lowest time in life. I had no income, I had no revenue stream, I had a mortgage to pay, and I was about three months away from going bankrupt. This point right here, this lowest point of my net worth is actually when I made my uh, how, to, how I learned to day trade in a, in a week video. So the idea behind this is, you know, during this low point and right here uh, where I had a dramatic spike in income, this is when I read the 50 books on money. So I read this in a five month period. I went back to work at my old career in manufacturing for five months and I basically listened to audio books for eight hours a day, five days a week through second shift for a five month period. I was averaging two to four books a week. And then you can see my net, my increase in money drastically increased as I educated myself in money. So you, this all spurred though from pain. This all spurred from a difficulty in life. So a lot of people, you know, there's two ways to go in life when shit gets rough. You either succumb to the pain, you, you succumb to the difficulties and you let them dictate who you are and they dictate your life and you can spiral out of control. You know, in extreme cases, people become alcoholics or a, a drug addicts or they just screw up their entire life. Uh, and then the other end is you basically say, no, this, this pain is temporary. This pain is only something that is happening because of the environment. It's not me. It's not who I am. I'm going to succeed. I'm going to you know, do what I said I'm going to do and become what, what I said I'm going to become. So, you know, for those of you who are in uh, situations in life right now, especially with this pandemic and everything that's going on, re realize that, you know, your life might be hard right now, but it's not who you are. You know, that pain and stuff is temporary. And as long as you push through it and you constantly work on yourself every single day, no matter, regardless of what's happening on the outside, uh, eventually you're going to come out on top. You just, you have to stay dedicated to what you're doing. But back to uh, Chris Henningsworth and conscientiousness. Um, <clears throat> so some of the things that I've been working on over this past year is becoming a lot more conscientious. I'll show you real quick my that my uh, what I ranked on this uh, assessment for the Big Five. So I'm 50% agreeable. Uh, I'm pretty compassionate. I'm very low in politeness. Like uh, basically, what this means is. I, I understand people's point of views and I don't, you know, typically have to argue with people, but I'm not going to be polite about what I believe in and stuff. You know, you know, I'll respect you, but I'm going to do me at the end of the day. Uh, conscientiousness is moderately low. This, uh, so I'm 31 percentile conscientiousness. I'm not a super organized person. Um, I know Mansoor, you're much more conscientious than me. You're much more organized. Uh, I, I know we probably butt heads a little bit sometimes. So when you get two people that are working together and one is very conscientious, and one is not. And so an extreme example of this would be somebody that's OCD versus somebody that just doesn't care about anything. Um, they can 
have conflict between each other because the OCD person looks at you and you're like, why, why do you live like this? How, how do you function in this situation? And then the, the aloof person is like, how, how, how are you so structured? How do you, how do you live life with all these regiments and all these schedules and stuff? So I'm, I used to be like 10 percentile conscientious. Gareth is under 10%, 5% conscientious. You know, me trying to improve myself. Uh, I've, I've been doing some things over the past couple of years to increase this. Then you get the two subsets of conscientiousness is industriousness and orderliness. Um, industriousness is like setting goals and, you know, achieving them. Orderliness, pretty self-explanatory, be orderly. Um, so I'm higher in industriousness, but I'm low in orderliness. But uh, my extroversion is 82 percent. Um, pretty self-explanatory what that is. I, I don't have high enthusiasm, but I'm very assertive in what I believe and what I do. So enthusiasm, for those of you who are watching that are getting into sales, especially my team uh, that's read the book, How I Went From Failure to Success in Selling, enthusiasm is probably the number one thing you need to focus on when it comes to selling. Because if you don't believe in what you're saying, if you're not enthusiastic in what you're saying, um, your words are just going to fall flat on your ears or on the people that are listening to you. Neuroticism, I'm two percentile. Uh, withdrawal, eight percent, and volatility, one percent. So I'm. It takes almost. I can't remember the last time I blew up on somebody. I'm not somebody that freaks out. I'm not somebody that gets stressed over situations. Um, I'm. I think that comes with my aloofness, my my low conscientiousness. You know, if things happen that are bad, another day. So people that are high in volatility, they, they, they're explosive, they're, they, they blow up, they, they react hard on things, they are, you could, you could interchange volatility with emotionalness, I guess, and then uh, withdrawal is basically like your anxiety, uh, how, you, how you deal with unexpected threats uh, in complex situations, I, I don't really struggle with those. So my openness to experience is 94. Um, and my intellect is 94 and my openness is 84. Now, don't confuse intellect with IQ and stuff like that. This is more abstract thinking and like your ability to basically curiosity. You, you, could, you could interchange intellect with curiosity. I'm a very curious person. So that gives you a quick rundown of my stats. But the way you can improve these when you take these tests, we'll, we'll start with conscientiousness. So I downloaded a few apps that have helped me out tremendously. The first one is Todoist. This is basically, you know, everything that I need to do in a day, and it's pretty advanced software. We won't get into it, but just download it on your phone and download it on your computer and then watch some videos on YouTube. Uh, there's even some really good Skillshare videos on Todoist and what it can do. I originally started at using it as um, a workout regimen, actually. So if I pull up my phone, old Thursday, these are archives, I basically had my workout regiments and I would put my reps and sets and my, uh, the weights that I was doing and I would just up the weights every, every week as I was going through that. So that's how I started using Todoist. Uh, now it's kind of segued into me organizing my day-to-day -day schedule and stuff like that, which leads us to the next uh, application and this is, will be useful for all my team. Uh, Calendly, this is basically where you can set up consultations and calendar events to meet with people and team events and stuff like that. Um, and then Google Calendar as well. This has helped me out tremendously on this day-to-day -day scheduling. And then, you know, to segue back into money, and the reason a lot of you guys are watching this, you know, in order to become wealthy and build assets, you have to become conscientious of your money. Um, you, if you, if you want to make, I, I have a saying, if you want to make business money, you need to treat your money like a business. For those of you who have seen the let's make a mill episode one, you've seen, uh, this graph, this, uh, spreadsheet, this is all of my finances. Um, so this is basically me, um, tracking all of my money, uh, through all the different things. So this is my income. This is my cash flow. This is where all my money goes, depending on what I'm doing. Uh, and then this is my balance sheet. Currently, I'm at forty-six thousand dollars in total assets. So, if you, when it comes to money, you have to be extremely conscientious of what you're doing. You have to track your money. You have to organize it and make sure you know where it's going, or else 
it, it will succumb to bad spending habits and you know all the worst versions of yourself. If I don't track my money, uh, Gareth takes over and he spends it all on dumb shit. So be aware of your conscientiousness, uh, especially when it comes to money. <sighs> but next up, you know, we'll, I'll, I'll show you a quick example of uh, openness to experience. So again, for those of you who have ever seen the show Shameless, this is Sheila, and she suffers from uh, agoraphobia, which is the fear of the outside. Or not. All right, let me restart this real quick. door and I take a step out yeah so I'm right. that that's a perfect example of somebody who is uh, not open to experience at all. They're extremely neurotic. Um, pull this back up real quick. So, you know, when you live a life like that, you're probably not going to have a lot of success in life. You're probably not going to be achieving a whole lot of stuff. <clears throat> so you want to work on improving your openness to experience. And that's pretty simple. I mean, it's hard to do, but it's simple. You just go out into the world and start meeting people. You start working on your extroversion. You start working on your people skills and connecting with people, learning some good books would be like how to win friends and influence people. Um, uh, team, do you guys have any other recommendations on books that would be good for uh, openness to experience? Or anybody in the chat? Anything uh, from Napoleon Hill is always good. Yeah, he, he, he was he the one that wrote... Uh, um, how to win friends and influence people? No, he wrote uh, Think and Grow Rich as well as Outwitting the Devil and 17 Principles of Success, okay. three of my favorites. Okay. Yeah, I've read the, the first one you mentioned. That was a good uh, book. Dale Carnegie, yeah, that's a fantastic one. Um, the, uh, one of the books that I recommended earlier, uh, How to Go from Failure to Success in Selling is also a fantastic book for uh, improving your uh, extroversion and your ability to help people and network with people. No, Garen, I, I don't know if you know this book or not, but uh, help me out. Um, Psycho Cybernetics, I believe. I've heard of it. I haven't read it. Oh, that's for you, Garen. That's a must. That's that's definitely a must. It's uh, one of Patrick's, I believe, top five books. Uh, but it's it's the story of a guy who's a plastic surgeon, and he built. And through his experience, he saw that he wasn't just a plastic surgeon. People would go in, they would, he would do, he would perform his plastic surgery and they would come out as a different person. So their personality, their confidence in themselves and how they view themselves would change simply because they fixed, they fix their nose, they fix their eyebrow, they fix, and for the, you know, for, for the rest of, for, for the rest of their family and friends, the people who see them, it's not that drastic of a change. But for them, it was it was it was like they came out of a different personality, and he was viewing how the mind, you know, it merges a lot of uh, neurology and how how he was basically operating on their mind and not just on their skin, right? So, psycho cybernetics. It's a very very good book. I, quite frankly, I didn't finish the whole thing. I read the I read a couple of chapters in, in there, but I, I now that you that you're talking about this. You're giving me more reason to go back and revisit that book. Yeah, that sounds like a really interesting book. I'll, I'll definitely read that. That that kind of reminds me of uh, you know physical fitness. You, you bodybuild, right, Mansoor? I do. Yeah, I, I think you know, phys physical fitness, especially when you're a guy doing anything that's competitive, anything that's uh, you know gets you moving and you know builds your physical body, is fantastic for building your confidence, which. In what you just said, retrospectively, your confidence influences your, ex your extroversion, which can influence your enthusiasm. So, you know, improving yourself, especially when it comes to physical fitness, is a really good uh, endeavor to do.
Um, and I think somebody else recommended uh, Cyber Cybernetics, uh, Amy. Um, then there was another book that I saw, Man's Search for Meaning, uh, Victor Frankl. That's, that's a fantastic book. That's one of my favorite, actually. Uh, it's a book written by a psychologist or a psychiatrist that was thrown into Auschwitz during uh, the, the uh, Nazi regime. And he documents the three, four drives of human existence. Like it's, it's like the deepest level of the kind of psychology that we're talking about right now. Um, you know, when you strip a man or a woman away from everything that they've ever owned or any kind of identity, um, you know, what is there left to that person waking up every day and, you know, not committing suicide or whatever. Um, it's a fantastic book. I, I highly recommend any, every, every person should read that. That should be a, uh, a book that is required reading all high schools across America. But all right, let's move forward. We're going to get into money now. Um, so I'm gonna, we're going to talk a little bit about how to quit your career um, and you know, get the life that you want. And I'm going to tell you some of the pitfalls and stuff that I did stupidly when I quit my career. Um, <clears throat> so again, back to back to the earlier slide of this four levels of wealth. When you're in survival and status, number one thing you focus on is cash flow. You want to make as much money as possible per month, per week, per year, so that you can invest that into uh, other things. If, if the, the example I give is, you know, I could, I could teach somebody any amount of money or any amount of knowledge they want on investing, but at the end of the day, if you don't have a dollar to invest with, you're not gonna get anywhere. So it, it all comes down to cash flow, first and foremost. It should always be your main focus uh, when you're in survival and status mode. Um, so there's a few things that will help you with that. The first is reducing your expenses. Um, track your expenses. I use Mint. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with that, I'll show you my Mint real quick. And I've kind of, I kind of wilded it out this month moving to Austin, Texas. Um, let me log in with this real quick. If I can remember my password. So this is my uh, budget on Mint, and I've gone way overboard this month being in Austin. You know, I live right next to a bunch of food trucks, so I've been kind of slacking on my spending. But uh, yeah, $400 on food and actually $800 on food and groceries and stuff. But what you can do is, you know, this goes back to conscientiousness and tracking your money. You know, if you don't track your money and you don't know where it's going, you're going to spend it badly. Um, so you have to budget, you have to build a plan on where your money's going and what you're putting it into. This all comes down to conscientiousness. Um, and then what you can do is take these numbers and then you can actually copy my spreadsheet, which I shared in the uh, Let's Make a Mill episode one video. You can find that in the description of that video. And basically, uh, I've got business stuff in here. What you would do is if you don't own your own business, just take the business stuff and delete the columns and then add some columns over here for your expenses for food and stuff. I, I don't track... Uh, itemized food and expenses because I use a credit card. So I just know I use mint as my itemized view. I can just look at it. And then I use my credit cards on this sheet as kind of the all encompassing expenses. But if you don't do it that way, you can just individually track uh, each one of your expenses uh, every month to uh, organize your money and figure out where it's going. So back to this paying off credit cards, you know, you, it, to increase your cash flow, uh, your positive cash flow, which is the amount of profit you have after every month that you can put into investments, you pay off your credit cards. You want to start with the uh, lowest or the highest interest rates ones first. And actually, uh, Eddie is going to take over in a minute and explain. Um, he, he's extremely knowledgeable on credit stuff. I'm not a credit guy. A lot of people ask me about how to build credit. I'm not the dude to ask for that. I have. I can hit a 720, 750 credit score, but I'm not an expert on it. There's some really advanced things that you can do with credit. Um, but let me run through these real quick and I'll let you take over, Eddie. So another thing is house hacking. This is actually back to this graph um, 
right here is when I learned real estate and I started to house hack. I actually got two roommates, Joey and another uh, friend of mine to move in with me. My mortgage was about 800 bucks a month. They, I rented out two rooms to them, uh, totaling $800 a month. So they totally covered my mortgage. And then I had uh, only to split utilities uh, three ways. So my monthly expenses went from like $1,500 a month down to like 400 uh, by house hacking. So in order to house hack, you have to uh, build your credit and then get build your wealth so that you can get a loan and then learn a little bit about real estate. But it's, it's for everybody that's watching this that's 22 years or younger or is, as long as you're old enough to deal with roommates, uh, at, at some point you get to the age where you're like, I don't want to have roommates anymore. I like my solace in my own time. But if, you, if you're not at that point yet in life, house hacking is the number one way to uh, free yourself from your career and free yourself from uh, your nine to five. So when you, uh, when you do that, it, it makes your life so much easier. And, and once you do that, once you house hack, you're never going to want to rent houses again. It's, uh, it's the renting is terrible, but uh, you know, you want to, I also never had a car payment. So my 400 bucks was only food and utilities. Uh, if you can, you know, it's nice to have a car, but if you're paying 300 bucks a month uh, in <clears throat> our payments that, you know, calculate that again over time. So 300 times 12, 3,600 bucks a year over a five year period. That's $18,000. If we want to do some rough compounding, um, let's say we get a 5% return over five more years. That's $22,000. Um, so, you know, have you can buy the $300 car and waste your money when you're young if you want. I would not recommend doing it. I would say buy a car up uh, front with cash and leave it as that. And then once you're making a lot of money and you've got investments and passive money, then buy a, a nicer car. Another one is learn to cook. You know, fast food and restaurants are extremely expensive. And as far as dating goes, if you're trying to date people, learning to cook can be a fantastic way to uh, go on a date with somebody if you know how to cook. Then uh, lastly, obviously, increase your cash flow. Build as, build as many uh, secondary streams, side hustles, whatever you want to call them. Just try to increase your cash flow as much as possible. But I'll, real quick, uh, I'm losing my voice, so I'm going to get some water. Eddie, I'm going to go ahead and put you on, and you can talk about, you know, the four things that are important when it comes to building credit. Uh, hold on. Let me. Right. Definitely. I just want to make sure that uh, you guys can hear me. Yeah. Can you guys hear him? <clears throat> yeah, saying they can hear you. Awesome. That's good. All right. All right, go ahead and uh, take it over, Eddie. I'm going to grab some water. Perfect. No worries. All right, so my name is Eddie, and I'm going to be showing you guys four steps how to master your credit. So first one is you need to be able to educate yourself. The biggest risk in life is what you don't know. The second step is to be able to fix your credit. You can't build a house on a weak foundation. Third is to build your credit. There are many ways to build good credit. Now, how many of those do you personally know? And lastly is to leverage your credit. Every multimillionaire knows and understand that credit is king. So in a scale from one to 10, where would you rank your knowledge in each of these four steps? And in what step of the process are you currently in? So your credit journey will differ from everyone else's. Your goals and ambitions with credit will steer you in a certain direction. Let me give you a few examples. You can get free airplane tickets, hotel rooms, and car rentals. You can buy real estate. You can make active and passive income and so much more. So to, step, uh, to save time, I'm gonna focus on mainly step one, then briefly go over the rest. So step one is to be able to educate yourself. There are six categories that make up your credit score. First one is your payment history. This refers if you make your payments on time. This category is by far the most important one. This accounts to 35% of your total credit score. So in order to have a good credit score, you cannot miss a payment. You must be at 100%. Number two is your credit utilization. This refers to how much of your credit availability you're using. Uh, this is the second biggest influencer to your credit score, and you want to be under 30%, preferably under 9%. For example, let's say that you have a total of $1,000 of credit available to you. 
If your credit card has an outstanding balance of $300 on the day it reports to all the three credit bureaus, since that is 30% of your total credit availability, your credit score will drop. Third is derogatory remarks. These may include bankruptcy, civil judgments, tax liens, and other collection accounts. This is the third biggest factor to your credit score, and you do not want to have anything in this section. Number four is your credit age. Your credit age is composed from taking the average age of all your open accounts. To have a good credit age, you must have an average age of credit of seven years or more, preferably over nine. Therefore, if you want to have, uh, if you have credit cards, never close them unless you absolutely have to. The longer you have a credit card open, the better for you. Uh, number five is your total accounts. This section is composed of all your open and closed accounts. This can be uh, credit cards, mortgages, car loans, personal loans, and student loans. So uh, in order to have a good credit score, you want to shoot for at least having 11 total accounts or preferably over 21 plus. Now, lenders prefer to see a variety of accounts in a credit report. They will find you more trustworthy if they see multiple credit cards, a mortgage, a car loan, because it shows them that you are responsible in managing different types of debt. And number six is your hard inquiries. Hard inquiries are placed on your report whenever a lender runs your credit because you applied for that credit. For a good credit score, you want to have anywhere from zero to two inquiries. Now, inquiries only make up 10% of your credit score. However, they do pile up. Anything over nine inquiries will start to, you'll start to see uh, you being denied for almost anything. And it does take two years for them to drop off your credit report. All right, now step two is to fix your credit. Since everyone's credit report is different, I will have to see your credit report in order to tell you exactly what to do. However, there are two things I can recommend you can do right now to start fixing it. Number one is to make sure that your personal information is correct and up to date with the three credit uh, bureaus. This will help you fight any accounts that show up on your credit report that are not yours. And secondly, you can focus on paying off high interest debt first. You want to pay off any account that is costing you money. After that, focus on accounts that have a high credit utilization. Always focus on one account at a time because this will bring the credit score up faster than trying to even distribute all your funds to all your accounts. Uh, step number three, two popular options uh, to build credit are, are getting a secure credit card. Uh, this is a credit card that is backed by a cash deposit you make up front. The deposit amount is usually the same as your credit limit. And number two is my favorite is becoming an authorized user. An authorized user is someone who can use someone else's credit in their name. When you become an authorized user of someone else's credit card, you will inherit their payment history. This can substantially increase your credit score because it will affect four of the six credit factors in your credit report. And lastly, step four is to be able to finally leverage that credit. And just two popular ways, uh, I can't get really into depth about it, but as to be able to buy real estate and to be able to sell your credit lines. And just to close off, uh, I just wanna let you guys know that the best time to start working on your credit is today. You don't put this off any longer. And you can start by checking on what's on your credit report. You can open a Credit Karma and Experian account and do not pay for money uh, for these. These should be free. And lastly, keep getting educated on credit. There's so much more <coughs> that I just didn't get a chance to cover. And three good websites to check out are Doctor of Credit, U.S. Credit Card Guide, and a subreddit called Churning. All right, thanks, you guys. Awesome, Eddie. Uh, everybody, if you want to thank him real quick for this, this is actually, is this your first live presentation, Eddie? Yeah, this is okay. it. So that you, uh, you just presented in front of, like I think, almost 200 people. Um, so I actually sat down with Eddie before this uh, uh I think two days ago, and kind of coached him on the process of writing a script for YouTube. Uh, I think he's going to start making content and videos on this stuff because he's extremely knowledgeable about this stuff. Um, I, you know, I know a lot about money, but I don't know a whole lot about credit. And, and this is a perfect example of uh, what we were talking about earlier with your, uh, you know, the most important things you own is uh, your network. So now. Eddie and I are on the same team together. We're working together. Uh, I, if I have any questions on credit and you know how to do that stuff, all I have to do is shoot him a text and stuff. So you know, it's not just about gaining your own knowledge, guys. It's also about who you know. You want to be you know connecting and networking with people that are knowledgeable and good at stuff that you aren't, because 
his knowledge is essentially now my knowledge. All I have to do is hit him up, hit him up for it when I have questions. Um, and I'll give you a quick shout out, Eddie. So do you have an Instagram or anything that you want to uh, direct people towards if they have questions and stuff on credit? Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, let me go ahead and shoot, shoot me the link in the Discord and I'll, uh, I'll throw it up here. Okay. So let me do that in a second. Yeah, good stuff, Eddie. Appreciate you for sharing all this information, man. Like Garen said, man, the, you know, the combination of minds as you're building a team and the, you get to borrow, you get to borrow the experiences from a lot of different people. And that just makes, there's a, there's also a compounding effect when it comes, when it comes to shared knowledge. So I appreciate you for sharing that, man. You killed it. And by the way, if you're able to do this, you should be, should be doing a lot more of it, man. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I got to keep uh, working on it. Yeah, no, it was, it was good. It was very good for your first one. It was a lot better than when I started doing YouTube. Um, I put it on the uh, yeah, Somebody said that painting in the background is really nice. It's, you, you said you, got, you picked that up in Tijuana for 10 bucks. Uh, yeah, so I love uh, going to Mexico. Uh, well, run, not right now because of the coronavirus. Uh, but I like going, since I live in San Diego, I drive just uh, down the border. And it's, it's such a nice experience every single time I go. And I love... Um, I, I love the culture, so I just pick up stuff, and that's definitely one of the coolest paintings I've ever seen in my life. So I definitely picked it up for twenty bucks. Yeah, I I, uh, I can't wait for the world to restart. We we're, I'm definitely going to Tijuana with you. Uh, <laughs> a little bit of Gareth might come out, but we'll we'll try to <laughs> we'll work on that. And for anybody that wants to uh, hit him up, this is his uh, Instagram, Eddie Garcia twenty three. Yeah. Uh, if you want to shoot him any questions on credit and stuff like that, feel free to. Or, well, is that cool with you, Eddie? I don't, I don't want you to just get my. Yeah, no worries. Go ahead. Yeah. That's okay. my personal account. So. Okay, cool. All right. So, yeah, that's credit. You know, the point of building credit for you guys is house, for as far as house hacking goes, is you, you have to have credit to get loans. The banks want to know that you're a capable and responsible person. That, that what they're really looking at is are you a conscientious person when it comes to money? They don't like loaning money to people who are bad with money and unconscientious. Um, all right, so um, my you know my quick recommendations on credit is uh, I always anytime I have credit card debt, you always want to pay off the highest interest first. This is called the debt avalanche. You might have heard of the debt snowball. It's another version. Um, financially, having a debt avalanche is better than a snowball. Um, but once you get your credit built up and you've got five thousand, ten thousand, twenty thousand uh, dollars acquired in your net worth, you can end up applying for a mortgage loan to buy a property. Now, obviously, you're going to need to educate yourself on real estate a little bit. So I'll give you guys one quick and dirty tip on real estate. Uh, it's called the one percent rule of real estate, which essentially is if you take a house, I'll, I'll show it to you on a, a calculator real quick. Let's say you buy a house for a hundred thousand dollars. You want to be able to rent it out for at least one percent of its total value. So one thousand dollars or one hundred thousand dollars times one percent is one thousand dollars. So I bought my house for one hundred seven thousand dollars. I rent it out for about nine eighty, and my mortgage is around seven fifty. I'm trying to get it dropped to around six hundred uh, pretty soon, actually. And the one thing you want to do with that is well, before I get into that purpose, um, you know, if you if you calculate a property that is under one percent or under 0.7 percent, you're probably not going to be cash flow positive, which means that you won't be making profit off of the investment, uh, which means that the house is no longer an asset; it's actually a liability because you're having to put money into it to maintain it. Um, and if you find a property that's two percent cash flow positive, um, also be careful because it's probably a bad neighborhood or it's a bad place that you want to you, you might not necessarily invest in. Just because something gives a better return on the numbers that doesn't mean that it's a better return overall when you have to factor in all the other risks and stuff. Um, but as far as uh, me dropping my payments from 750 down to 600, there's two ways to do that. One, I'm switching over my insurance from a homeowner's property to a renter's property. And I'm also dropping my PMI, which if you don't know what PMI is, definitely write that down and research PMI. Essentially, it's it's extra payment you're going to have to pay uh, every year if you don't have 20% down or more in equity. So when you apply for loans for a mortgage, 
very important that you at least get 20% down so that you're not paying PMI because it's just extra interest that goes out the door to uh, the banks. The PMI is terrible. Um, but yeah, once you increase your cash flow, um, you can begin leveraging your assets. So a quick, you know, YouTube, my YouTube channel, I actually consider an asset. So I'm leveraging it right now. I'm, I'm connecting you people with my team and, you know, this knowledge and stuff. So, you know, assets aren't necessarily just physical things that, you know, it's anything you want to get in the mindset of as an investor, as using anything you have, no matter what it is, as a potential source of connecting with people or networking with people or building your network or building your other assets with money. Um, other th ways you can increase your cash flow is obviously demand a raise. You know, back to uh, uh, the, the five big traits, agreeableness. Typically, women are less agreeable than men. Um, by almost one, uh, one fact, I can't remember what it's called, deviant factor. I can't remember what it is, but it's a, it's a big gap between the average man and the average woman when it comes to agreeableness. And what psychologists have found is that actually is the main trait when it comes to making more money in a career. Because if you're combative, if you're somebody that's very aggressive or very assertive, very, uh, you know, direct in what you want and you, you don't falter, you're not, you're not a pushover, you're more likely to get a higher raise in your career because you're not going to back down when you uh, want a raise. And you're also going to probably ask for a little more. So working on, you know, being more direct and more assertive when it comes to a career can help you with becoming, uh, getting a better raise in your career. You can also apply to new positions for increased pay. There's some YouTube videos out there on like how to increase what you're making every, uh, every year. So essentially you, you work at a company, you go to apply to three or five other companies that are similar and you see which one gives you the most uh, money for whatever you're doing. You go to work for them and then you just keep repeating the process depending on if you're free to move and do stuff. And you can actually drastically increase your pay by your career based on uh, doing that process. And then the last one is obviously create a second or third source of income. You know, there's all kinds of different side hustles that you can do. We're not going to dive into them in this video, but at the end of the day, it always comes down to increasing the amount of money that you're making per month, no matter what. I'll show you guys a quick uh, thing that I'm actually working on using my Google, my Calendly. So a lot of people have been asking me for paid consultations and I've, <laughs> I've always turned them down um, just because I'm so busy and I don't know, I've always kind of just been on the fence about that. But I think I'm going to start doing paid consultations, 30 minute calls with people and to just show you, you know, how to factor a side hustle in. So let's, let's say you do any kind of side hustle. It doesn't have to be a paid consultation. But let's say you make an extra 400 bucks a, a week times four weeks. That's about $1,600 a month times that by uh, 12 months. That's $19,000 a year extra that you can put into an investment or something. And this actually becomes even more profitable when you factor in taxes if you understand how to build a business on an LLC or a corporation. That's not that's not nineteen thousand dollars as a uh, employee. That's not taxed as income if you start an LLC or a corporation and you run that money through a business, and then you can start buying things like your car or your anything that is related to you making money becomes basically tax free. So if you make an extra nineteen thousand dollars a year, and you know you need a vehicle to get somewhere, you can buy a vehicle for nineteen thousand dollars, and you pay no taxes on that money because it's considered a business expense. And then you compound that over three years, that's $57,000 in a three year period. If you apply some compound interest to that at a 5% rate, one year, two year, three year, four year, five year, six year, seven year, eight year, nine year, 10 year, 11 year, 12 year. Uh, so, you know, quick and dirty way to calculate money based on side hustles and stuff like that. Again, comes down to being conscious with or conscientious with your money. <clears throat> okay, so moving forward, this is a concept I kind of want to share with you guys. I'm working on a video with it, uh, but it's it's called Time to Success, and I actually derived this from playing video games, so I'm sure there's probably a lot of people in here. You know, you get, Do we have a lot of Call of Duty fans in here, or Halo, or any kind of shooters, uh, Battlefield, anything like that? We got some gamers in here. Um, if, if you are a gamer and you're, if you're 
a, a min max person, if you're a, you know, a statistics person, if you try to always be at the top of the leaderboards and stuff, um, you probably have ran across this concept called uh, time to kill, which is essentially a st statistic off of uh, the guns in a video game. So uh, it's basically if you were to pull a trigger, how long would it take to defeat your opponent in a bat in a one-on-one -on -one battle? And a gun with a shorter time to kill, let's say a .3 time to kill versus a .7 time to kill, your that gun is statistically better than the other weapon that you could be using because it's going to defeat your opponent at a faster rate. Well, I took that concept and kind of uh, applied it to time to success. So when it comes to becoming successful in life, there are fast ways to do it and there are really slow ways to do it. <laughs> P90 Gold with Mara, okay. DPS, yeah, it's similar to DPS, but a little, a little bit different. Um, so, you know, the three, the analogies I want to use here is basically roads. You can take a dirt road, which in this example would be like uh, building your first business from scratch. If you're young, if you're not knowledgeable, if you don't have mentors, if you're just doing something to do something and you don't really have any guidance, I would consider that a dirt road. A lot of people have hit me up on like ventures, like, hey man, will you invest in this or are you interested in talking about this? The first questions that I ask them is, how many businesses have you started? How many have been successful over two years? How many mentors do you have and how many businesses have they started and are, and are they successful? If the answers to those are bad, I, I don't even consider it because there's so much risk there that you just aren't aware of. Um, things like do it yourself, any kind of new industry or technology. A lot of people hit me up on, do I invest in Bitcoin? I, I think in trading in Bitcoin is fine, but as far as investment, when it comes to investment psychology and investment mentality, I, I will not invest in Bitcoin because it's a new technology. It doesn't have any tangible value to society other than it's just another form of currency. The, the only value it has is people use it continuously. And people, if people see value in it, it's kind of like gold. You know, gold is valuable only because people see it as valuable. But as far as an investment goes, I, I don't consider Bitcoin a good investment because it's not proven. It's a very new technology. It's, it's not something that has been used for decades. Or, you know, real estate has been around for 10,000 years. You know, uh, life insurance has been around for 2,000 years. You know, anything that's old and tr proven and true I'm more likely to put my money into because there's a lot better chance of success because it's been around longer. Um, you have to pay sales tax and you still have to declare your business expenses as evidence that you create um, and therefore will be paid. Yeah, so that's, talk to a CPA, Koosh, again, I, I probably should have pre uh, faced that with when it comes to making side hustle money and building an LLC, you definitely want to consult a lawyer and a CPA and you want to talk to a professional that knows what they're doing when it comes to handling your money in a business sense because the, the statistically the IRS is going to audit people that are uh, – the biggest demographic of people that are audited from the IRS are people under two years of business. If you start an LLC and you're under two years of being in existence and cor incorporated – there's a really high chance that you're going to get audited. And if you do your taxes through like TurboTax or something and you don't have a CPA uh, handling your taxes, there's an extremely high chance you're going to get audited. And if you don't know what you're doing, you're probably going to be paying penalties and stuff. Um, but the next one is, you know, paved road. This is more like college careers, you know, online courses, uh, secure industries, trade unions, military. These are proven systems and roads that will give you some kind of amount of money. <clears throat> but it's usually a fixed amount of money. It's not, it's, it's going to get you into the status level of the four levels of wealth, but it probably won't get you into the freedom level of wealth. Um, you're going to have to take an interstate to get into freedom and purpose level of wealth. And that comes with anything that's scaling, any kind of growth industry, any kind of franchise or uh, business, or also having invested mentors that people that train you and teach you into uh, whatever it is you're doing. So scaling my YouTube channel would be a good example of that. Uh, I look at my YouTube channel and I have always looked at my YouTube channel over the past 10 years as an asset to build passive revenue. So every video that I make and upload, it's going to get views for the next five years at least. And that's passive sources of income. And it's also scaling sources of income. So as my YouTube channel grows and I get more subscribers and I get more followers, more people are going to watch my video. So the compounding effect 
of that money is going to only exponentially grow. Um, growth industries, you know, there's a lot of different growth industries right now. Uh, tech, tech is always a growth industry. Uh, artificial intelligence is a growth industry. Um, I don't know. Would, would you say would you say insurance is a growth industry, Mansoor? I mean, I get it's an old industry, but technically it is kind of going through a revolution. Well, I mean, it depends. I mean, relative to relative to, for example, technology, all that different stuff. That's uh, that's you know, that's a uh, that's an industry that's an inception, and then you obviously have an explosion phase. Insurance is a little, little bit different because, uh, as you said, it's one of the oldest, oldest industries in the world. It's a two thousand year old industry. If you examine how churches function, if you examine how 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 these dynasties have have always been there it's because of it's because of annuities right colleges universities churches uh boston a lot of cities were were built on annuities of they date all the way to benjamin franklin right so it's it's a very stable industry i don't know if it would be considered by uh growth industry parameters per se but if you take into consideration what's taking place right now living in the biggest wealth transfer in the history of the united states having uh, over 40 to 68 trillion dollars being injected in this industry in the next 10, 20 years because baby boomers are simply retiring. I mean, would that would that you know classified as a growth industry? I mean, I'll I'll, I'll leave that up to you for you guys to, to decide. I just could. I, what I, well, what I know is this: it's a place to create wealth. So yeah, um, I'm not about the parameters though. <laughs> yeah, that's that's one of the main reasons that I was attracted to uh, insurance because I was looking into real estate. But I, it, what, who was, who was talking um, yesterday or the day before? Uh, they were, they were talking about Benjamin Franklin had an annuity for Boston or something that expired in like 1996 or something. Correct. Yeah, that's that's crazy. I didn't, I didn't know any of that stuff. I, I wish there was better books on uh, the history of uh, finance. But uh, I want to go back real quick to the credit. I forgot about this. I just pulled this up. This is a question for you. Um, Eddie, so this is M1 Finance. This is uh, one of the brokerages that I recommend people using for long-term investing. And they, they have a credit card uh, system uh, called the, M the M1 card. And it's 3.5 for the average user and it's 2% for the uh, uh, a plus user. And essentially the criteria is if you, once you cross the $10,000 mark in your portfolio, they give you a credit card which you can leverage up to 33% of your total account. So if you got $10,000, they basically give you $3,300 that you can use as a credit card at any, at any moment's notice, and it doesn't dip out of your actual portfolio. So, well, I just lost. Yeah. So, you know, what would what would be your recommendation on a, on a credit card like this? Because the, the interest rate is so low. Uh, yeah, um, well, I'll definitely have to read the fine print on it. Uh, I've never seen that, but it's definitely uh, very interesting that uh, that they're uh, giving you a credit card so you can leverage that credit to be able to uh, keep investing in it or invest even more. Uh, because as you said in one of your videos, uh, to be able to invest, you do need to have money. And so if you have all these lines of credit where you have available uh, money uh, at your disposal, it, that's that's a great uh, source of uh way to make more money yeah. using else's money to make yourself some money is great yeah the uh one of the things that i was told about real estate is interesting is um you, you actually don't want to have too much equity in a house because it's basically money that's just sitting there not doing anything you're not leveraging it you, you want to take that money out and put it into an investment that that grows so you know one it's it's, it's kind of bad investment practice really if you have a house completely paid off uh, I mean, it's it, it's financially secure. You feel confident about the money because it's there. But Correct. That's what I was gonna say. It it all depends. Like when I was talking about credit, it all depends on the person's goals. You know, um, uh, for you, it might be a bad investment to just have uh, all this money in in your house as as equity. But if someone who just wants to be able to uh, live a uh, a nice life, don't worry about keep scaling and not worrying about all these things. They they just you know want to have a few properties be able to have uh, passive income coming in and just relax and spend time with their family. That, that's 
fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure you and all these people in this call are very ambitious people and they're not going to be okay with that, you know? So it all depends. Yeah. It depends on your risk tolerance and your goals. Um, Correct. Yeah. And my last thing I want to say about scaling is uh, sales. When it comes to cash flow, you know, if you guys are trying to be millionaires, the best way to do it is sales. It doesn't matter. It's It's one of those... The downside of sales is it's hard and it's intimidating and it's a zero sum game. So if you're bad at it, you're just not going to make money. Uh, but once you break that level, there's a saying in sales that your first 50 sales are the hardest. But once you once you finally sell something, uh, it only gets easier from there. And for most sales positions, whether you're selling cars or you're selling real estate or life insurance, or it doesn't matter what you're selling. Um, you're only going to improve as you do it more and more and more, which means you're going to, the money that you're making is going to scale with your skill level. Um, whereas when it comes to a career or a job or a trade union or the military, you're only going to get paid what people believe. What's that saying, Mansoor? Um, are, are you going to let people tell you what you're worth? Or are you going to, how's that go? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what you, I mean, I, I, I kind of get what you're saying. I don't know if there was a, a specific saying, but, uh, you know, I mean, what would you, would you rather let somebody else determine what you're worth? I mean, are, are you, are you getting paid what you're worth or, uh, you know, why would you, are, are you comfortable leaving it for someone else to, to decide what you're worth or would you rather, you know, you know, take control over that? So. Yeah, sale, uh, sales is. I know what you're getting at, but it's 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 not something that's that's coming to my mind. I'm I, I forget what the saying is, but uh, but yeah, I mean, basically, it the the underlying concept is taking control, right? How how much how much control would you like to have? How much control would you like to have over over your income? Because once you figure that out, unfortunately, unfortunately, you know, if if you if I'm, I'm sure the audience here knows poor that you know rich dad poor dad, right? It's a uh, it's uh, you know to be the number one uh, book in personal finance it's a very famous book and in that book you know you you kind of you kind of understand having a rich dad versus having a poor dad at least mindset wise and the rich dad was was conditioning robert kiyosaki to learn how to make money and one of the fundamentals i think it's number the first lesson in that book is that the rich don't work for money and it's a very paradoxical concept because <laughs> you're like, well, what the hell are we working for then, <laughs> right? And so it's a very paradoxical concept, but uh, it goes to show you that the skill set of learning how to make money is a skill set in itself that unfortunately we haven't been taught. Would you rather fit? Would you rather feed? You know, would you rather be fed a fish or learn how to fish? Learning how to fish is not a skill set that we've been taught, unfortunately. We've been conditioned to believe that we have to go accept a, a paycheck for somebody else to feed us. It's kind of like uh, a, a slavery type of mentality. So that skill set, when you talk about sales, listen, it's a muscle to be developed. It's not, it's not easy, as you said, but once you master it, the world becomes your oyster. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, when it it depends on your goals. Like like me and Eddie were saying, if if your goal is to just have a couple hundred thousand dollars and you know live a comfortable life, you don't have to get into sales. I mean, it, you can still achieve that with sales. But if you're trying to make a million dollars, be a multimillionaire, sales is the number one way to go as far as making money. Um, I had something else I was going to touch on. Oh yeah, but um, essentially, you know, when it comes to scaling. A sales or a job. Um, when you work a career, you're being told what you're worth. With sales, you're the, the market is only the market is going to pay you for what you're worth. You know, it's it's one of those things that your your the amount of money you're making dictates your by your skill level skill level rather than somebody else telling you what you're worth. Um, all right, to move on, we're almost going to wrap this up and then we'll get to questions. So I want to lastly touch up on money management and um, basically get you guys' minds thinking on uh, long-term investments and everything we've been talking about. So this is a graph that I built for types of assets and we have security assets and we have growth at, or risk assets, which are volatility and growth. So um, 
we'll start with the bottom end of security. We have savings accounts. Now, most people, the majority of middle class and uh, lower class have been taught that you, you save money and you know buy a house and live your life and you, you retire with your retirement accounts. What we're finding, especially now in our generation, is that's not working and it's not going to work if you look at the numbers uh, in the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, pension plans are 20% funded. They're about to go in solvent. You know, there's major financial issues that are looming in this economy and in this country uh, that people just aren't educated on and they don't know much about. But savings accounts are actually one of the worst things you can put your money into when it comes to investing because most of them don't give you at least a 2% return on your investment. Um, and when you factor in inflation every year, your money's getting worth less and less. So like right now, if you had $10,000 in your bank account, it's a, it's a good amount of money, but 20 years from now, it's going to be nothing. Uh, if you think back in the 1980s, 1970s, you could buy a car for $2,000, $3,000. Now they're forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. Um, I mean, you can still buy a $2,000 car, but it ain't going to be, a brand new car off the lot. <laughs> um, so savings accounts are one of the worst things you can possibly put your money into. As far as investment mentality goes, the only time you keep money in a savings is uh, for a protection against downside. So for example, if you own a lot of real estate, you want to have at least six months uh, in cash in savings accounts or in a, some kind of uh, liquid investment that you can quickly pull out of. Because in the event of a recession and you know, a pandemic outbreak, uh, when you start getting mass vacancies, that people aren't paying their uh, rent anymore and you, you still have to pay your loans, you need to have cash back to protect against that downside. Um, so that's really the only time I've been informed to use a savings account. Next one you have is CDs. These are government uh, things. I don't know a whole lot about CDs. I just know that they're um, not the greatest kind of investment. You have treasury bonds. You can actually invest in these in the stock market. Um, real quick, I'll pull up a few. So, uh, SHI, EIE, EIF, uh, TLT, these are all uh, in investment grade treasury bonds. Next up, we have IULs. These are actually life insurance policies, uh, index universal lives, also called indexed annuities. Um, these are the things that I'm currently learning about. And I'm trying to educate myself with, with this company I'm working for and my team. Um, I don't know enough about them to you know, give you really down to, uh, accurate numbers and data and stuff, but essentially I can, I can tell you the concept behind them. Um, first, they're not taxed like a 401. They're, they're often compared to a 401k and a Roth. Um, I have to be careful with the terminology because I'm becoming a life insurance agent, but a, the difference between a IUL and a 401k and a Roth is they aren't taxed. So with a 401k and a Roth, the 401k is ta taxed in the beginning, the Roth's taxed at the end. The way I explain this to people is, would you rather be taxed on your seed uh, in the springtime or your crop harvest on, in the fall? Or would you like to not be taxed at all? And that's what an IUL is. So first, tax-wise, they're extremely good. They're also the number one asset that uh, multimillionaires and billionaires use to pass on wealth. Like Mansur was talking about earlier, there, uh, Benjamin Franklin had an annuity that didn't expire until uh, early 1990s. He, he, he donated it to a city to use it, help it uh, develop the city for that period of time. Um, what else am I missing, Mansur? You know, oh yeah, the uh, so the different the other major difference between a Roth and a 401k or a 401k and an IUL is, as you've seen. A lot of people right now are losing their retirements when they when it comes to 401ks and Roths when recessions. You know these retirement plans are really good during bull markets, but they're not good during a recession. So when you've got a if you're 55 to 60 years old and you're about to retire and there's a looming threat of a recession and you've already lost 20 to 30 percent of your retirement funds um, due to this situation and then you retire and you start pulling out that money, you're essentially locking in losses. Uh, and that's one of the worst things you can do as far as an investment mentality goes. And an IUL is essentially the exact same as a Roth or 401k. It capital appreciates with the market, but it doesn't lose any money on the downside. So it, it's essentially a hedge. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about hedges in a minute. I'll show you some graphs on what a hedge is and kind of show you some visual representation of a hedge versus a, a, a risk growth investment. But moving on, there's corporate bonds, which are a little bit. They're I'll chime in real quick about that, Garen. 
Do I? Yeah, go ahead. So one one last thing they, that we have men, that you uh, did not mentioned about IULs is, is liquidity, right? Yeah. So the best way to think about an IUL is everybody loves a Roth. Why? Because a Roth allows you to grow your money tax-free, take it out tax-free, right? It doesn't hammer you on taxable when you take it out. The downside of a Roth is that if you make a lot of money, you're not going to qualify for it. And even if you qualify for it, you're limited, you're constrained to the cap. And the cap, I think, right now is $6,000, if I'm not mistaken, for 2020. So rich people do not qualify for Roth. Ultra wealthy people do not qualify to have a Roth. Yeah. So as another tax haven, as a different tax haven, what, what, what they use, believe it or not, is life insurance. So life insurance, in this example, IULs, which stands for Index Universal Life, is uh, often called uh, a rich man's Roth because you're not constrained to how much money you can put in. Uh, wealthy people view life insurance as a very, very, in a very different mindset as with everything else uh, than than what the what the average Joe you know views life insurance uh, to be, which is basically an expense. Wealthy people view that as an asset, so it's a it's a place for them to accumulate wealth and to pass down wealth from gen from generation to another. So when you compare that, there's an acronym called the LASER Fund. Douglas Andrew, which I know, uh, again, you're, you're a big fan of. He's the author of Mr. Fortune 101. His latest book is called The LASER Fund. So LASER is a acronym that uh, the audience here could utilize uh, to assess between different investments. And it stands, L stands for liquid. Uh, S stands for safe, R stands for rate of return, and then T, laser test, stands for non tax, right? So laser funds are, are funds that are liquid, that are safe. And when we talk about safety, we're not talking about, you know, the safety of, of, of um, we're not talking about uh, to what extent uh, are the, the underlying investments are, if it loses money, it's not safe. So when we say safe, safe from any downside. So yeah. they're hundred percent shielded against loss. R is for rate of return. And then T, these are tax-free products. So an IUL in a nutshell allows you to obtain life insurance and also have some uh, what's called cash value and what that does is that in the last, if you examine the last 20 years, Gary, and obviously you're a guy who studies markets, we've had five recessions in the last two decades. You know, the dot-com burst and then 9-11, the housing market, the financial meltdown and that, and now this coronavirus pandemic. Well, a lot of people right now are thinking to, to, to themselves, how come, you know, the rich are getting richer and the, medical, and the middle class are getting wiped out? The gap between the rich and the wealthy, between the rich and the wealthy versus everybody else is becoming wider, wider, wider. Well, why is that? One of the reasons why, it's not all of the reasons, one of the reasons why is that rich people understand how to grow their money in good economies and not lose anything in bad economies. Yeah. And that's exactly what our clients have had. In the last 20 years, our clients have lost literally zero. Why? Because they're protected from downside loss. Not only that, Garen, but as you know, one of one of the biggest things that tends to ban the number one reason for bankruptcy in the United States is not because you and I entrepreneurs go and, and start a company and we we file bankruptcy because it didn't it didn't work out. The number one reason is actually medical bankruptcy. So when somebody endures a sickness, when somebody goes through some type of cancer, stroke, heart attack, long term illness, which eight out of ten people will eventually face. Most people liquidate everything that they saved. So they're, all of those assets that you spoke about, the savings account, the 401ks, the check it, the house, the real estate, you're going to go refinance your house just to recover your health. In this example, you don't have to go and touch your assets. You're not going to go touch where you spent 20, 30, 40 years saving. Why? Because the life insurance that you bought actually gives you an advance when such events take place. So you don't have to spend down your wealth. The insurance company is going to tell you, okay, you have a million dollar policy with us. We're going to give you 90% of it while you're still alive to go and recover your health. And then eventually when you pass away, guess what? 
insurance company pays you a death, pays your family a death benefit to make sure that all is good. So when you view this, it's a very different way of viewing finance. It's a defensive way to ensure that if any variable that's outside of your control, when they take, when such events take place, it's not going to, nobody's going to come and stick their hand into your pocket. Not somebody in China, <laughs> not somebody in Washington, not a lobbyist in the, in the, in, the, in you know in the, in DC, not somebody who's making decisions in, in Singapore. You're immune to any of these events. So it's not a place where you put all of your wealth, but it's one of the assets that you want to include in your portfolio to have that time. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, this is actually uh, yeah number one rule in investment: don't lose money. Number two. Don't don't remember rule number one, but uh, yeah, that that actually reminds me. So the IUL is really kind of like the M1 finance card, whereas you know you can borrow money off of your asset, which is your investment portfolio, but you're not losing that. You're not locking in those losses. Kind of, it's kind of the same concept. Um, and we actually had a guy in the chat, Mansoor. Um, he might actually be somebody that would be very interested in an IUL. Uh, Thomas Mead. I've added it. I've added to Roth the past ten years, but joint income is too high to continue adding. So whenever funds are there, are locked in until I make less money. So he's essentially capped out. You know, this is this is also one of the benefits of the IUL is uh, a Roth. You can only put put six grand into per year, and that's it. So any money past that is going to be taxed and it's going to be put into something else. But uh, I mean, if you're looking to invest more money, Thomas and uh, build your wealth and build a passive, secure source of income. And IUL is something you definitely want to look into. If you want, Thomas, like, uh, shoot me a DM on Instagram. Um, or, you know what, let's, let, let's, my DM is inbox is so full on Instagram that I probably won't be able to see you. So let's, you know, shoot Mansoor a, uh, a DM. This is his uh, Instagram. And for all you guys that want to follow him as well, and again, back to, you know, segueing back to building a network. This is why Mansoor is in my network. This is why I joined this is because he's extremely knowledgeable in this stuff. And I want to learn more about it. And I want to know every detail and every nitty gritty thing uh, when it comes to IULs. Because they're, they're the best long-term wealth building and wealth protection asset. They're, they're definitely the best hedge that I know. Um, for those that don't know what hedges are, we will exp I'll explain those in a minute. But... Let's uh, keep moving forward and try to wrap this up. So the next one is corporate bonds. These are kind of similar to treasury bonds, but they're a little less secure. Uh, we won't get into the details of them. And then we get into gold and silver. Gold and silver is considered, I consider it a security, a hedge, because it, a lot of times they will gain appreciation when the markets are crashing. So the, the main line, the white line that I've got drawn here is is the asset going to drop with a market crash or is it going to maintain or even move up on a market crash? So anything that moves up or maintains, I consider a hedge and security versus anything that drops. A lot of people, especially middle class and lower class, they consider 401ks and Roths as secure. They consider them as a hedge or a wealth protection. I, I don't see them as that because they will lose money on a downside market crash like they are now. Uh, and then we've also got real estate above, which real estate's a broad spectrum in its own. It depends on what you're investing in. Uh, Airbnbs would be high risk, high reward. Uh, I actually know a girl here in Austin who's got a couple of Airbnbs and all of hers are vacant right now. and She has no cash flow coming in. But when they are uh, being rented out, she can make really good money with them. So high end uh, in, uh Airbnbs would be a high risk, high reward. Then you get into like apartment complexes or one uh, single family homes or duplexes. And then actually, I would can actually consider lower income houses as more secure, especially when you get into um, Section 8 housing and government subsidized housing because, you know, the government, you're basically kind of insured and kind of protected by the government itself. That money's always going to be coming in unless the U.S. government collapses. And then uh, you also have like trailer parks and mobile homes and stuff, which are always vacant, no matter, or they're always, they always have vacant, uh, a high vacancy rate, no matter what the economic cycle is. So, you know, that's real estate in a quick and dirty. 401ks and Ross, I'm not going to get into those, you know, they're for retirement funds. Just, you can look them up on Investopedia if, you, if you're not familiar with them. Then you get into more growth, uh, 
investments like dividends, indexes, growth stocks, uh, and then like the high end, high risk. Uh, I guess trade trading would be up there between sales uh, and business. Um, and then we have sales, which is just pure cash flow, and then businesses, which is also very high cash flow, but can also be a lot of risk if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, and then one thing that we haven't factored in or I haven't showed you about is also taxes. Some of you are, are pretty well versed in taxes or you're learning taxes, so you, you understand some of the tax implications on these assets. But uh, it's, it's hard. I also factor in how heavily something is taxed. So the reason dividends and indexes and growth stocks are on the higher end of risk rather than a 401k and Roth is because they're going to be taxed at capital gains, which is 15%. Or if you're tr if you're a day trader and you're trading, uh, selling and buying stocks within under one within and under one year, you're going to be taxed as income, which can be anywhere from 15% to 30%. You know, uh, we talked about the the downside of taxes in the uh, 50 books video. Yeah, I mean, yeah, software tools. If you can if you can take a secure six figures job over sales, absolutely. But most people can't get a six-figure job uh, unless they have, you know, years of uh, college. And then you also have to factor in all the debt that it comes with acquiring that career and that job. And you also have to factor in the risk that you might not like that career and job. And, you know, you're going to probably have to work at least 10 years uh, to pay off that debt and build up your assets. Your, your jobs, a six-figure job, yeah, if you can get a six-figure job, with low debt and uh, if you get a full ride scholarship to college by all means do that do that absolutely but for the majority of people that's not a reality you know, that's that's a very high risk thing i, I consider getting a, a six-figure job as a higher risk than sales because you can go into sales immediately you can do it at 18 years old you don't have to you know, go to year, years of college and when you're that young you don't know what you're doing with your life you don't know if you're going to actually enjoy what you're doing um, but the longer you invest into that, the more specialized and niche down you get into it, uh, the more risk there is there. Okay, so moving forward off of this, I'm now going to explain to you guys uh, money management and hedging. So this is kind of the fundamental concept of uh, active investment for long term. So what you're looking at here is two graphs. I'm going to move uh, my team out of the way so you guys can see this a little bit better. This is um, the SPY, which is the S&P 500. It's the overall index, the top 500 companies in the U.S. market. This top graph is essentially uh, the quick and dirty version of the health of the U.S. market. So the bottom one is gold, GLD. And gold is considered, in my opinion, well, in everybody's opinion, as a hedge. It's something that is you can put your money into for a secure return. So before I kind of explain this, I want to show you uh, this on my actual charting software. So I'm going to pull up SPY real quick. We're going to, what we're looking at here is the month chart for all you people that are watching that don't know anything about technical analysis, uh, especially those that are watching this through a recording. Don't worry about any of the stuff that's going on here. The only thing I want to focus on is uh, this. So each bar here is a month. We're looking all the way back to 2007 up to the current day. And if this right here is the housing market crash of 08, and this is one of the biggest financial crashes of the past hundred years, other than the uh, the uh, um, the, or the 1929 crash. <clears throat> so Right here is the top end of this crash. This is essentially the highest high that the market made before it collapsed. If I hold down shift and click, I can drag this down. <coughs> and you can see that it didn't recover for 66 bars, which is about three years. So from 2007 to 2013, the US market collapsed and it did not return to previous highs until that period. Uh, and it also lost 55% of its uh, value at the bottom of the market crash. So, you know, again, back to retirement funds and, you know, 401ks. 401ks are fantastic in a bull run. They're, they're not good when it comes to uh, um, recessions because you can lose 55% of your total investment. So <clears throat> now let's take a look at uh, gold. So... This, this line right here, this one line is the uh, when the market recovered, March 1st of 2013, around that time. 
If I flip over to gold, we scroll back. So the market, this is the high of the market, the low of the market, and then it returned to its previous high and went long. And this occurred in a 20 bar period, which was from February 08 to October 1st of 09. So only about a year and some change is when the, the when gold recovered. And then it also only lost 33% of its money, but it actually made up to 84% returns on the long end. And this is before the market even, uh, the actual overall market returned here in March uh, of 13. So, you know, when you look at just gold, gold and the S&P 500, the S&P 500 crashed and stayed low for three, almost four years. Gold recovered within uh, just a one year and some change. And then it actually went long for another uh, 23 bars, which is about two years. It made a high of 84% return. And then it collapsed when the market returned. And this gets into market psychology and the way markets move. So the way I explain technical analysis to people is it's, it's purely a visual re representation of, if, if you were to take 100,000 people and have them looking at this chart, this chart is a visual representation of their opinions. That it's, it's, it's not numbers, it's not calculations, it's not, there is that stuff behind it and that can drive it. But at the fundamental level, it's just people's opinion. It's a visual representation of people's opinion. So when people get scared, when they get panicked, they, they go from that growth, that they go from that growth and that risk mentality. They, they flip-flop, actually. Let me pull up. Uh, so back to this chart. They, they go from that risk mentality and they get scared. They, they, they drop into fear. And when they drop into fear, they shift to a security mentality and try to protect their money. So they, they pull all their money out of the growth stocks and the, the volatility stuff, and they put their money in the secure stuff like gold and silver or corporate bonds or treasury bonds or, or savings accounts, IULs, you have a massive like shrinkage of money being pulled from all of these high risk assets and putting them into security assets. Now this is, this is the mentality of the average person. This is the mentality of people that don't really understand investing. They don't understand the fundamental concepts of investing. But when you educate yourself on these things and you understand how these markets move, you can then use that knowledge to make profit off of it. For example, so let's say you've got $100,000. You got 50,000 in the US market, you got 50,000 in gold. This I also I would not recommend doing this for explanation purposes to keep it simple. So the US market crashes. A typical person is going to panic and they're going to become fearful and they're going to pull their money out and they're going to put it into something else. The reason that's a bad thing to do is because it's if you're locking in losses, you you the market will return as long as a certain few factors come into play, which we won't get into. Basically, as long as the U.S. GDP increases, markets will return. As long as companies grow, markets will return. Uh, but the average person is going to get fearful and pull their money out. And they're going to try to put it into something. And they've basically locked in losses. And the market bounces back, and then they're like, oh, shit, I lost out uh, on the return. A savvy investor is going to see the market pull, uh, fall, and they're going to say, Sweet. The stock prices have just gotten cheaper. You know, a, a good investor is going to look at a 55% decrease in price as a 55% de decrease in price. You know, these companies are still solid companies. They're still going to weather this. They're still going to continue to make money. So you look at this as a discount. You look at this as bargain buying. You look at this as like getting a really good price on something that is cheap. If you walk out of your house and your neighbor puts up a sign and says they're selling your house and you go over and talk to them, uh, and they say, you know, oh, I'm selling my house, and they tell you the number, and that number is like, you you know that n that number is like 50% off of what the house should be, assuming that the house is, you know, fine and everything is working and everything's clean and everything. It would be absolutely ridiculous of you to not buy that house if it's 50% off. So the savvy investor is going to see a market crash as an opportunity, and then they're going to use, they're going to see their security, they're going to see the money that they have in their secure hedges and their gold and silver and their bonds and their IULs, they're going to see that as potential profit that they can make. So as these markets, as the gold and silver moves up, as the IULs hold, you pull that money out and you leverage it and put it into the underpriced assets. And then you make profit on the, uh, 
come up of the market. And then you take that money back out and you, you pay off your loans or you pay off your IUL, you put it back into your gold and silver, you, you protect it back into uh, the protective assets. So you've made money on the profit side. So that's the quick and dirty of hedges and market movements. But I'll, we'll pull back or I'll, I'll bring up this chart one more time to show you, you know, that process. Yeah. So, you mind if I ask you a quick, a quick question about this segment? Yeah. So uh, I'm actually I'm actually curious to know because you know uh, the first time I was introduced to technical analysis was when I read um, the very first book I read about finance was a, a random walk down down Wall Street. Author is uh, Malkiel uh, Burton, if I'm not mistaken. But anyways, um, and and I I majored in finance and economics, obviously. So the academia community and and you know people who follow fundamental analysis they bash on technical analysis and they don't consider it uh to be a viable way of going about finance it's it's, it's kind of like hey this is for, for it's it's, it's kind of like a knockout right um if, yeah. if, if you don't know fundamental I, analysis right so i'm curious to ask you because i know of technical analysis i've never i've never applied it uh, do you i mean i, I know you traded in the, in the past how, how viable is it? Is it something that you could study, make a career out of? Is that some, are, are those tables, is that just up in the air or is it what fundamentalists say, it's pure randomness and those charts, those charts according to what they, what they say are meaningless? Under, under one year, yes, they are correct. They're not explaining to you the entire concept of technical analysis. When it, when it comes to day to day, week to week, month to month, even one year time frame. Yes, move, price movements are very they're not random. There are there are patterns and you can read the patterns and you can trade. If if it wasn't real, day trading wouldn't exist. People that are traders wouldn't make profit. So that entire concept that that doesn't work is wrong. It it, do, it does absolutely work. Now it does take a tremendous amount of dedication and experience and understanding. Do that the the way I the, the number one thing I tell to anybody that's looking into getting into trading is, you know, I could give you 30 books on how to play basketball. I could give you 30 books on how to play golf. I could give you 30 books on how to uh, play any sport. It doesn't matter what it is. You're not going to be get, get good at any of those sports unless you play. So when it comes to trading, it is 100% time invested. It's just like sales. You're not going to get good at sales by reading sales books. You can learn concepts. You learn the ideas. You can understand the. You, you can become an academic uh, individual on that concept, but you're not going to get good at it without doing it. And the way to get good at uh, trading, which is under one year time frames, is basically sitting at a tr sitting at a computer all day, every day, and watching charts move up and down. And you place your money and you, you trade. You actually you actually actively trade. There's a statistic in trading that 95% of traders blow up their first account. In my opinion, it's 100%. I've never met a trader that didn't blow up an account. Um, and that's because you get you got to get your ass beat quite a few times before you learn the lessons of trading. Um, now, when it comes to long-term investing, it's a different story. <clears throat> so, okay, have you ever, you studied statistics, Mansoor? You ever studied statistics? Yes, of course. There's a, there's a, there's a quote by, uh, um, uh, Sherlock Holmes, uh, it goes, the individual man is a complexity of uh, randomness, but in aggregate, he becomes a mathematic mathematical certainty. Does that make sense? Yes. So when it comes to long time frames of technical analysis, that randomness becomes a trend. And that's what you read on the trend. So... I'll, I'll show you. I'll show you how to use technical analysis for long-term investment. We got the we got the two charts here, gold and silver. <clears throat> we have. Let me do this real quick. <clears throat> so, U.S. market crashes down here. We, if we look over here, we're in the we're in a very similar uh, outlook. We we have this big pullback. This is actually the beginning phase of a flag pattern. Um, the market is probably going to pull back down longer. It might go, it might return if, if everything goes back to normal. This, this is actually kind of an interesting event as far as stocks go, because we've never had a pandemic that shut down. We've never had the entire world shut down like it is today. So this is kind of a new uh, pattern that's emerging in the market. 
as far as technical analysis goes, but we still have this massive pullback. So look, look down here at gold. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, we, we have two lines here. This one was the first pullback of uh, <coughs> the first pullback of 2008. Uh, remember in December and January when we had you know, people were talking last year about the market pullback and it returned and it uh, continued long. That's, uh, that happened because the markets were a little bit overextended and that gets into PE ratios and a few other things that we're not going to talk about in this video. But as soon as this pullback happened, people started to panic and then all of a sudden gold shot up. Gold made a very long move, and then uh, it's panicking again, and gold is going even longer. So when you understand this and you can, you can read these charts, when people panic, they're going to move into secure investments. They're going to move into gold and silver. They're going to move into inflation hedges. They're going to move into corporate bonds and stuff like that. <clears throat> so back to the 50,000, 50,000 analogy or explanation, if you've got... $50,000 in gold and you just leave it there, you let it, you let it return to previous highs and you let it go long because people are going to pump their money into it because it's going long. You can, you, there's this concept in trading called, uh, you want to, you always want to buy weakness and sell strength. Does that make sense? So when market, when, when you've got money in, in gold and it's going long, you should be selling out. You shouldn't be buying. The novice investor, the person that doesn't know what they're doing, they're trying, they, they have what's called fear of missing out. They're putting money into something that's moving up and they, they see it's moving up, but they don't understand these concepts. They, they are, end up losing money because a lot of times it'll pull back. But because you already have your money in there, you've already made those moves before they've happened. You're making money on the upside. So you're taking money out and you're putting it into the enterprise stocks. So when it comes to portfolio management and money management, it, you're continuously cycling your money from underpriced stuff to overpriced stuff. And you can use the technical analysis to do that. Does, does that kind of answer your, your question? Oh yeah, of course. Appreciate you, man. Good stuff. Um, and I, 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 I'm not knocking on uh, fundamental analysis at, at, at all, by the way. I, I actually am a huge fan of fundamental, ana fundamental analysis. I think using both in conjunction will just make you a better investor overall. Um, but if we go over to, let me go back to the gold and silver. So gold has made a 37% increase in the past year and some change uh, off of that first pullback. Right now, uh, I would say gold's a little overpriced. Silver is actually the better buy right now. So this is the silver chart. And this is uh, all the way back to, this is the housing market crash and then the big long run up. Gold moved uh, 150% during the housing market crash uh, after the housing market crash before it returned. And now gold or silver is actually underpriced. Now there are some factors that you have to put into play here on silver. So um, I think there's more silver being mined than gold right now, but at the end of the day, it is still a precious metal. And when mines run out, that's when demand increases and supply decreases. So you get those massive spike movements. So as far as a pure, uh, what's the better buy? I, in my opinion, it would be silver, but it depends on your time frame. You know, silver might not silver might not be a good play for six months, three years, five years, but ten years, twenty years, I think. Silver is the better option. All right, so that pretty much wraps it up. Is there any questions on you know everything that we talked about or hedging and protection stuff? Chat, do you guys have any questions? Team, do you have any questions? Let's see how much we got to 112 viewers left. We almost hit 200 on this live stream. I think uh, we had a total of 3,339 plays. So we, we had a total of 3,000 people jump in here uh, during the stream. How do you know if a stock is overpriced or underpriced? <laughs> that's, that's an entire live stream on its own. Um, quick, and, you know, quick and dirty, I'll, I'll show you a quick and dirty way outside of technical analysis. If you go to Seeking Alpha, um, let's do, do Visa real quick. 
So all you all you look for is your PE ratio, and then you compare PE ratio to its peers. So if, if I click on the peer chart, we got Mastercard, Walt Disney, Microsoft Corporation. Um, what I'm looking for is PE. Um, so non PE 45. So just from a pure quick and dirty one number calculation, um, Visa is underpriced over uh, MasterCard. MasterCard's at a 45 PE ratio, whereas 38. So PE ratio is price to earnings. That's the price of the stock based on how much money the company makes. You take those two numbers and you factor a uh, ratio, which is called PE. And then if you pull up the chart, you can probably see similarities. So this is Visa. I'm going to switch this over to a weekly chart just so we can see a little bit more data. So this is the Visa chart. What was MasterCard's ticker? MA. MasterCard's about the same. So the charts look the same, but as far as a fundamental analysis, if you're doing long term, uh, PE is a little bit lower. But there's a lot of other things you got to factor. Um, like the, uh, it, just watch my long term investing series. If you want questions on that, or if you want answers on that, uh, how to long term invest or dividend investing, episode one. Yes, yeah, so this will be saved. Can you explain leverage on credit once more? Um, so, uh, ask you know, explain that out a little bit, Amy. Leveraging what? Using it to buy a house? Yeah. So I mean, uh, there's multiple things that you can do uh, once you have credit. Uh, it's not the whole point. It's just not amassing so much credit and not using it. Um, so one of the things that you can do is uh, there's th different websites that you can use. I believe uh, the most popular one is called plastic.com where you can uh, use your credit cards to be able to purchase uh, uh, certain things. And, and with that is you can buy real estate. Uh, for example, um, uh, many real estate investors uh, can do this um, because for example, whenever you're trying to buy or sell a house uh, and if there if the property is distressed uh, you it doesn't uh, you can uh, use conventional uh, funding from a bank because the bank wants the house to to not have any holes or it has to be in top shape so any buyer can buy it so if the your house is distressed and you're trying to sell it well uh, your buyer can use conventional uh, 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 funding so a your buyer will probably be uh, a real estate investor and that can count as uh, they can use any sort of lending sort of um, hard money private money uh, their own type of money or credit uh, so when you when you have credit you can uh, use these websites that allow you to uh, take that money out without doing the cash advance option because then that's going to definitely charge you interest and you will be able to uh, purchase those properties, uh, fix them up, and uh, pay off your uh, your credit card debt uh, from that. That I, that explains a little bit. Yeah, that was a good one. Is there any more questions? And then we'll uh, shut this off. I think the how long's the stream been going? <sighs> Do I have a time frame? I can't see a time on it. But oh, we actually did hit 207 at our highest peak on the stream. Uh, they're asking high interest rates. Eddie? Uh, for the credit cards? Uh, when you use a credit card for buying real estate. Um, so yeah, it, it all depends. Um, there's many things that you can do to uh, counterbalance that. And it's really advanced techniques that I will take forever for me to be able to explain this here. Um, but um, usually uh, when you get a promotional offer on certain credit cards, and also um, this is not only in just your personal uh, credit, credit this uh you can open an lc and get business credit and that's a whole different ball game and then you get these massive lines of credit so you're not talking about let's have a thousand dollars of credit line we're talking about 50 to 100 to ex exponentially more uh, thousands of dollars of credit in your uh available to you through your personal or or business and with those um you get um deals like zero percent interest on the first six months or 
a year or 18 months. And you can leverage that those opportunities on those certain credit cards to be able to buy those uh, opportunities. Um, and, and that's how you do, do it. Or you can do balance transfers uh, between credit cards uh, before they report to the uh, to the credit agencies, um, because then your credit score will drop because all of a sudden you're gonna they're gonna see that you're using so much utilization out of your credit card. Uh, but uh, it's it's a lot of stuff that I will have to cover. And um, the, but basically how you do it is you're, as you're shifting balance from one credit card to another, uh, depending on the term of whenever you're about to sell the house, you refinance it or you sell it. And then you get that money back, you pay off any of your credit cards. So if you use any hard money or private money, you then eventually pay them. Um, I, I'm not familiar with uh, James uh, Salmon's training system. Um, and I also, uh, somebody hit me up on Instagram, tips on moving your whole life to a new place. I think you said, is this, uh, is this the guy that was living in Croatia at its club? No. Yeah, I've never moved to a different country, but I would recommend, you know, just educate yourself, build yourself up, just like everything we've talked about in this video. Save up some money, have a, have a cushion as far as financials go to uh, move and I don't know, Mansoor, you've moved to different countries. What's your recommendations? What's what's the question again? Uh, I, I believe he's uh, he's 15 years old or 16 years old. He's looking to move to America from Croatia. Uh, he's trying to move his entire life over here. And I know you're you're from Saudi Arabia. Well, I mean, what's what's the X that we're solving for here? Well, what is it? What is it that it starts with? What What do you want to accomplish from from that move? I mean, the United States is is the powerhouse of the world. Um, you're 15 years old. I mean, I don't. Th I'm I'm a big believer in the United States. The state of the economy right now is is shaky. Uh, if you want to create wealth and you speak you speak, um, I'm not sure about Croatia. I don't know what the language there is. I don't know if it's a specific language. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think anybody could go wrong in the United States, uh, especially if you're planning on becoming part of this industry that we're in. There's a lot of disruption taking place. It's the, it's the number one, you know, uh, if you look at the world's wealth, it's centralized most in the United States. So I don't think that's, ever, that's gonna change soon. Now, there are, there is talk, are we, is the, as the empire falling at some point, it will fall. We've been we've been leading the world for for hundreds of years. Uh, is this the beginning of the end? I don't know. But uh, as as far as the information, as far as what I see right now, I'm going back. So I can't advise you not to come there. Relative to Croatia, the biggest the biggest product that the United States offers is its capitalistic system. That's it. And nobody could become a somebody. You could go from zero to hero. It's not buying a house. It's not, it's not become, it's entrepreneurship, right? It's the fact that you could go there and create massive amounts of wealth, regardless of your color, regardless of your skin, regardless of your last name, regardless of all that. So that is still true. And that's the reason why I'm, I'm in the United States. If those things matter to you, I recommend it. A lot better answer than I give you. I, I, I was born and raised in the U.S., so not really the guy to ask for that. <clears throat> All right, guys. Well, thank you for joining this live stream. Uh, hope you guys got a lot of uh, knowledge out of it, a lot of information out of it. Hope you took notes. If you didn't, it'll be recorded and up on the uh, YouTube channel for the uh, next couple of years, hopefully, unless as the demonetize me and rip all my videos down. Hey there, Dominique. So Dominique's actually one of my long-term trader friends. He was my Discord for back in the day, uh, one of my lead guys. I actually hit him up to talk to him about life insurance if he wants to do it, but he's doing his own. Yeah, we'd, we'd love to connect with him soon and see what he has on his mind. Say that again. I know. I was just saying good stuff. You know, we'd, we'd love to connect with him soon and see what he has on his mind. I mean, at, at the end, at the end of the day, you know, uh, uh, building, building our team in terms of going after, you know, our vision is to build a hundred billion dollar 
company. We're just, uh, you know, the fact that we're shaking hands with people, not everybody's going to be interested in terms of uh, joining the movement of the crusade. But at the, at the end of the day, conversations never hurt because, you know, the reason why we're doing this is we're, we're, we want to add value to as many people as we can. And uh, at the end of the day, that's what the, uh, what the, underlying, what the underlying mission is. Yeah, he's uh, he's currently develop, developing a trade execution platform. He's a tech guy living in Orlando. Are you still in Orlando, uh, Dominic, or did you move to Tampa or something? You know, what, just go ahead and uh, DM me on uh, Discord, Dominic. I'll, I'll go ahead and wrap this up and let everybody go here because this has been pretty long. Go ahead and shut this down. But yeah, okay, Clearwater, Orlando, nice. When uh, the world restarts and I come to Florida, we'll hang out. Long time going, trying to hang out with you and Leggy and uh, Tyler if he ever returns and from grave or wherever the hell he went. <clears throat> but uh, all right, take take care, stream. I'll see you in the next one. I'll be doing another one of these probably once a month for the next three years. Uh, just a better way to connect with you guys and uh, talk about things more active rather than uh, trying to because there's no cross-communication there. Good stuff. Well, thank you, Gary. I appreciate you, Matt, for, uh, for doing this. I'll see you guys uh, on the